This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo. This is episode 224 of the program, and today is Friday, January 10th. This is our very first episode of 2020, but before we get to any stories, we've got to take some time to thank all of the people who make the show possible. Our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which signed up over the holiday to support the program. And that includes All Things Knoxville, Anahara13, Andrew J. Stoffer, Camilla Carrasco, Cecile Gill, Chewy Treme, Glenn Purdom, Hernan, Ivan Avila, Jim Vaccaro, Julie Edwards, Katie J0706, Kenny Bush, Librarian, Linda J. Childers, Lord Boo, Mari McCarthy, Matthew Wisniewski, Michael Duffy, Millie Denny, Morgan, Nadia Zayman, Nightwig, Louis Godoy, Positive Definite, Rebecca O'Connell, Richard Escariga, Sarah Spaghetti, Thomas I. Osaz, William, and Yolanda Kuros Soto. So thank you so much to all of these kind souls. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. Once again, we have a jam-packed episode for you this week on The Humanist Report. We'll chronicle Trump's escalation with Iran, starting with his killing of Qasem Soleimani, what lawmakers like Bernie Sanders and Ro Khanna are doing to tie his hands. We'll talk about Iran's retaliatory action in Iraq, and finally, Trump's response and assessment of the situation overall. We'll look at Bernie's current status in the Democratic primary and see how well he's doing when compared to 2016 at this point in time, his argument against Joe Biden's electability, Joe Biden's continued love affair with Republicans, Ocasio-Cortez's thoughts on the misery of having to share a party with someone like Joe Biden. We'll talk about Judge Judy's endorsement of Mike Bloomberg, and I'll talk to Professor Harvey J.K., who is the author of Make America Radical Again, where we'll discuss the history of the United States' radicalism, and finally, we'll close the show by talking to 2020 congressional candidate from Oregon, Amanda CB. So that's what we've got on the agenda for today's episode. Let's waste no time and get right to it. Enjoy the show, everyone. Hello, everyone. I hope that you are having a fantastic day considering the circumstances. I didn't want to wait until Monday or Tuesday to talk about this because it is incredibly important. So I decided to make a video now. As many of you know, uh, President Donald Trump has killed... Quds Force leader Qasem Soleimani, and um, this is an act of war. It would be as if, you know, Iran killed one of our joint chiefs, um, the vice president. It's of immense consequence. I can't stress that enough. And there's a lot to go through. And um, I just, I couldn't wait to talk about this. Like my heart was racing last night as I was lying in bed thinking about this because the consequences of this, I mean, we don't really know. There's a lot of uncertainty currently, but what we do know is that nothing good will come of this. This is a drastic escalation, to say the least. Now, the first thing that I want to point out is that the only reason why we're contemplating the prospect of war with Iran is specifically because of Donald Trump. Had he not torn up the Iran deal, this would not be what we're facing currently. But because he doesn't really have a strategy when it comes to the Middle East, um, and because Obama did it, well, that's why he decided to pull out of the Iran deal, which kind of led to this escalation in the first place. So understand, first and foremost, that we are the aggressors here. We are the ones who are continually poking a beehive, poking the beehive that is Iran, and no matter what we do to escalate, we always paint ourselves as the victims. Now, we'll get to the specific details about Soleimani's uh, murder. He is someone who is incredibly popular in Iran. So this is going to galvanize the people who are against the more moderate leaders in Iran. This will embolden the more extremist individuals who hate the United States. Um, I mean, if you were in Iran... Would you take the side of people who want to work with the United States, who has continuously, you know, spat in your eye? So 
obviously that will be what logically follows. But, you know, putting aside the situation currently, I want to talk about U.S. domestic politics first because I think it's incredibly important. Over and over again, Donald Trump has stated that he believed Obama would take us to war with Iran in order to secure his uh, electoral chances back in 2012. In fact, he even said this uh, numerous times via Twitter, and he said this on video as well. Our president will start a war with Iran because he has absolutely no ability to negotiate. He's weak and he's ineffective. So the only way he figures that he's going to get reelected and as sure as you're sitting there is to start a war with Iran. Now, Donald Trump may be a blithering idiot, but I think that his political instincts are are better right than a lot of politicians. He knows one that incumbent presidents, they do benefit from incumbency in and of itself, and also from a relatively good economy, at least if the media is saying that, but they also uh, benefit from war, right? People tend to rally around the president um, whenever there are times of war, and even if we've kind of been in this a constant state of war now for uh, decades, basically. I mean, he believes that this will help him. So we have to understand that that is part of his motivations. Maybe not necessarily all of it, but he kind of revealed that he believes that an incumbent president can, in fact, benefit from going to war with Iran. So the fact that he's doing this now is incredibly conspicuous, and the media should point this out again and again and again. And, you know, kudos to individuals like Ilhan Omar, who are, in fact, taking the time to to point this out. Now, let's talk about the details of this. So we decided to escalate, right? We unilaterally escalated, but yet that's not the story that Trump's administration is telling us. So media is reporting that Soleimani was planning an attack on U.S. diplomats and service members. Mike Pompeo called this attack imminent. And last night was the time that we needed to strike to make sure that this imminent attack that he was working actively uh, was disrupted. And he said this with a straight face, as if we would all believe him after our government told us that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. Nonetheless, Donald Trump implied that the attack was um, defensive, and it actually was done in order to prevent war. Imagine being so naive to believe something like that. Uh, Mike Pompeo actually contends that the United States is now committed to de-escalation. So as usual, we are the victims, right? We would never do anything to escalate with Iran. Uh, this is basically us taking a defensive action to stop an attack that was imminent. And even if Donald Trump's administration claims that they want to de-escalate and that they don't actually want war after killing one of Iran's main leaders, well, understand that we are prepared if they want war. See, we escalated, but if they respond, it's still us that are the victims that are responding to them. And we're ready, but we don't want that, but we are ready. We have the best intelligence in the world. If Americans anywhere are threatened, we have all of those targets already fully identified, and I am ready and prepared to take whatever action is necessary. And that in particular refers to Iran. So when Iran responds, which I think that's inevitable, they will respond. Trump is saying we're ready for a response. And when they do respond, we know the playbook that, you know, Donald Trump's administration will use. They did X, Y, and Z, or Z, and now we're just responding. They're escalating. Don't, you know, take into consideration the fact that we escalated by killing Soleimani. Don't consider the fact that we tore up the nuclear agreement, which was a peace deal. It's always them. We're always the bad guys. And nothing that we do is ever bad. It never warrants criticism or skepticism. So war with Iran is now highly likely, and you can actually argue that it has begun because what Donald Trump did is an act of war. And predictably, people who are benefiting from this are already seeing the benefits, right? We see defense stocks on the rise. I mean, it's exactly what you'd expect. And there would be maybe a glimmer of hope if the media was competent, but they are already manufacturing consent for another war. You have CNBC persuading people 
to believe that someone that they've never heard about, I mean, how many Americans know who Qasem Soleimani was? Well, they're supposed to believe suddenly that this was the world's number one bad guy. You know, if, if you're the number one bad guy in the world, then most Americans would have probably heard about him. But, you know, this is the narrative that we're supposed to believe. We have Fox News bringing on guests suggesting that Iran, uh, you know, they're going to be in the streets celebrating this. Uh, you have the New York Times publishing articles from former Bush administration officials who cheered on the, you know, war in Iraq, who lied about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction, and who are, you know, being published in the New York Times cheering on a war with Iran, as Carlos Maza pointed out here. Um, so, I mean, the situation is incredibly bleak. Now, um, I do want to share some uh, tweets with you because, you know, the media, they're not a good opposition force. They're not the fourth estate in actuality. They're not doing their job. But, you know, we do have an opposition party, so you would hope that Democrats would do a good job, right? Not, not exactly. So we have just one statement that I'm going to share from Chris Murphy, which I think represents the totality of responses from the Democratic Party, with the exception of individuals like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Ilhan Omar, predictably, and of course, Bernie Sanders, who's the only presidential candidate who actually had a competent response. But basically, the response is, you know, Soleimani was a bad guy, but, you know, maybe we shouldn't have done this. They always start with that caveat. And that's problematic because they're trying to justify and rationalize this attempt at escalation, which was brazen. But you don't have to add that caveat. Just admit that what Trump did was bad. Stop trying to justify our escalatory actions in the Middle East. That's what they do. And, you know, this this response to that response from Chris Murphy by Hayes Davenport is, I think, perfect. Watch, every Dem statement will begin with a first sentence like this, and that's how they'll drag what should be a hugely unpopular war into the realm of nuance and viability and take the best political opportunity they could possibly be handed and just biff the fuck out of it. Exactly. Kyle Kalinske also responded to, you know, Nancy Pelosi, who says that Trump launched airstrikes killing Iranian general without authorization. So they're not necessarily against it, but they just wanted you to ask for permission and they would have ultimately probably said yes. And, you know, Kyle says here, process criticism instead of substantive criticism. Sir, you didn't fill out the proper paperwork. We're so fucked, dude. And I mean, that's it. That's basically where I'm going to leave you with because that's that's the situation. We are fucked. I will show you Bernie Sanders' response because I do believe that his response is solid. It's basically what you want to look for in a leader who I believe will actually de-escalate. But um, let me see. He put out a response yesterday that I want to find for you. Sorry, and I'm a little bit discombobulated here. I'm um, a little bit sick. But um, here we are. When I voted against the war in Iraq in 2002, I feared it would lead to greater destabilization of the region. That fear unfortunately turned out to be true. The U.S. has lost approximately 4,500 brave troops. Tens of thousands have been wounded and we've spent trillions. Trump's dangerous escalation brings us closer to another disastrous war in the Middle East that could cost countless lives and trillions more dollars. Trump promised to end endless wars, but this action puts us on a path on the path to another one. Now, one issue that I take with this is that Bernie Sanders is not pointing out the number of Iranian lives that would be lost in the event we went to war with Iran. Because, I mean, is anyone expecting this to be a war that is waged in Oklahoma? Of course not. This would happen in the Middle East. Maybe it's a proxy war. Maybe it's a war directly in the streets of Iran. We don't know what the end result will be ultimately. But this is going to kill a lot of people, Americans, but mostly Iranians, right? So the loss of life should never, ever be something that we overlook. It's something that is so disgusting, so devastating that we should absolutely always put that at the foremost, you know, at the front of our concerns, right? It should be our foremost concern because essentially people in, you know, Iran and the United States, they have only indirect control of what their leaders do, right? In the United States, we can take to the streets and we can protest, which we should do, absolutely. But ultimately, Donald Trump, uh, is he really going to be moved by public opinion? I'm not sure. So we can only scream as loud as we possibly can in hopes that we have some influence over the situation. But the influence that we ultimately will have is minimal. And regardless if we protest or take to the streets, Donald Trump will do what Donald Trump does. He has a massive ego. And if he truly believes that this will help his reelection chances, he will do what will facilitate 
his re-election because we know he has no strategy in Iran. He has no Middle East or foreign policy strategy. Like before he was elected, he didn't know the difference between the Kurds and the Kurds. So the man is an idiot. He's going to do what he thinks will benefit him. Now, there's a couple of factors here, right? He's not just going to take us to war with Iran if he thinks that that will help him win re-election because he also is balancing out you know, this 2016 message of our leaders are stupid and they want to take us to war with Iran. But at the end of the day, you know, we are living in a time where America is comparable to George or Orwell's 1984 totalitarian state, right? Where we are fed lines that are so laughable. They're the polar op opposite of what is the truth, right? War is peace. Freedom is slavery. Ignorance is strength. That's essentially, you know, the situation that we're living in when we escalate with Iran directly and we're told that we're defending ourselves um, and that an attack was imminent. I mean, who, who believes that? Who believes that? Give us the evidence. Give us the proof. You don't have any because it's not something that is uh, that was imminent. Nobody believes it. So I think I'll leave that there. We'll certainly, um, I'm assuming, revisit this by uh, Tuesday, uh, assuming that nothing else happens. I'm sure that the story will continue to develop as this is developing as I, I talk about this. But nonetheless, I just want to leave that there and let you all know this situation is incredibly, incredibly important and be prepared to take to the streets to protest to prevent a war with Iran. You know, there were protests against the Iraq war um, and that didn't necessarily have an impact. But nonetheless, make sure that you do everything you possibly can as a citizen to, um, you know, tell our government war with Iran is absolutely unequivocally unacceptable and out of the question. So on Friday, we talked about Donald Trump's reckless decision to assassinate Quds Force leader in Iran, Qasem Soleimani, and predictably, Iran has threatened to retaliate. But it's been days since this took place, and I don't think Donald Trump, even now, knowing what we know, grasps what he did. The gravity of the situation. I mean, he galvanized the entire country of Iran because this was someone who was iconic in Iran. And as you can see from this video footage here, courtesy of Amal Saad, thousands, possibly millions, came out to stand in solidarity in Iran with Qasem Soleimani. And State TV estimated that millions of people actually came out. Now, they're not necessarily the most reliable resource, obviously, but nonetheless, you can see for yourself here that there are a lot of people who are showing support for him and you know even though iranian citizens are not as theocratic as their government they're more egalitarian and secular than i think most americans realize i mean they still respect people like salamani because he was an icon in iran because he was fighting a threat to shia muslims and as rania Kalik put it on twitter isis is a fascist death cult that sought to genocide shias the group was an existential threat to the region. Soleimani is viewed as a superhero for leading the fight against the Middle East version of Nazis. That's who Trump assassinated. Exactly. Trump doesn't understand the gravity of the situation. And the Daily Beast reported that just days before this happened, he was bragging to people at Mar-a-Lago that there was something big that was going to happen in Iran. So he's a child. He doesn't understand and he assassinated the leader of the Quds Force, who was a hero to Iranians. And now Iran is pressured to respond. Because if you do nothing in this instance after the United States just escalated, then, you know, you will lose legitimacy, right? So we don't know how they're going to respond. Maybe it's a cyber attack. Maybe it's proxy wars. We have no clue. But what we do know is that they're under pressure to respond. And Donald Trump doesn't even fully comprehend the global ramifications that his action that I'm assuming he took willy-nilly caused. And predictably, you know, he threatened them again on Twitter, anticipating a response from them, but he didn't just do like the usual threat that he usually does to states and state leaders. He literally broadcasted that he is intending to commit war crimes in Iran if they do respond, saying, let this serve as a warning that if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, we have targeted 52 Iranian sites representing the 52 American hostages taken by Iran many years ago, some at a very high level and important to Iran and the Iranian culture. And those targets and Iran itself will be hit very fast and very hard. The USA wants no more threats. So I need you to really just pause and reflect on that. The president of the United States is telling Iran that 
he's going to violate international law. He's going to do literal war crimes. War crimes that the international community agrees would be war crimes. Things that Donald Trump and his administration agreed constitute war crimes, literally. Because as CNN's Eric Levinson reports, an attack on a cultural site would violate several international treaties and would likely be considered a war crime. In 2017, for example, a United Nations Security Council resolution condemns the unlawful destruction of cultural heritage, including the destruction of religious sites and artifacts. That resolution came as a response to the Islamic State's destruction of a number of major historic and cultural sites in Syria and Iraq in 2014 and 2015. The UN was clear then that actions targeting cultural locations constituted a war crime. The deliberate destruction of our common cultural heritage constitutes a war crime and represents an attack on humanity as a whole, said the spokesperson for then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon in 2015. Nicholas Burns, former Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and Ambassador to NATO, noted the Trump administration supported the 2017 UN resolution condemning destruction of cultural sites. So Trump can't feign ignorance here. He knows that this is a war crime. That's why he tweeted it, because he's trying to tell people, look, I don't care about international law. I don't care about the global standards that the world has agreed to. I'm going to do what I want to do, because I'm the leader of the United States, and I, as well as the country that I run, we're above the law. So if you want to retaliate, try it, because we're going to do war crimes. I mean... That's the message that this sends. It also communicates to the world that we are a lawless nation. We're not willing to follow international laws. So, I mean, when we uh, condemn other world leaders for violating human rights and not following international law, I mean, we have a president who's now broadcasting that he doesn't actually really care that much about the law. And um, whatever world leaders agreed to would be a standard. He's going to do it anyway. He's going to do literal war crimes to prove a point. Now, the framing of this is still absurd to me because he attacked Qasem Soleimani allegedly because there was an imminent attack, which has not been proven and I think nobody believes. Um, so, therefore, the killing was justified. And since we were acting in self-defense, well, any response is illegitimate and therefore an attack on us. That's not a retaliation they're the ones who are instigating the attack. Like, that's the mindset. Like, it's delusional. Like, I don't care how nationalistic or patriotic you are as an individual. If you don't see through this, you are delusional. We are the most narcissistic country in the world, and we think that there are no consequences for our actions. And whenever we do something, well, if our, you know, action militarily provokes a response... We're still the victim even if we initiated that. There's just no standards. We can do whatever the fuck we want, and that's that. I mean, is there much talk about this in the media? I mean, a little bit, some murmurings here and there. But, I mean, the president just admitted he's willing to do a war crime. That should catalyze some type of response. I don't know what would be the appropriate response, but something other than fucking crickets. But, thankfully, there are people who are trying to stop further escalation. Ro Khanna and Bernie Sanders predictably are being leaders in this situation, and as Tal Axelrod of The Hill explains, Senator Bernie Sanders and Representative Ro Khanna on Friday introduced legislation that would block funding for any offensive military force in or against Iran without prior congressional authorization. The legislation from the lawmakers, two of the most progressive members of their respective chambers, came after the U.S. launched an airstrike in Baghdad that killed Qasem Soleimani, Iran's top general. The attack and Tehran's vows of retaliation sparked fears that the already combustible situation in the Middle East could lead to a war between the U.S. and Iran. Today, we are seeing a dangerous escalation that brings us closer to another disastrous war in the Middle East, the lawmakers said in a statement. A war with Iran could cost countless lives and trillions more dollars and lead to even more deaths, more conflict, more displacement in that already highly volatile region of the world. At a time when we face the urgent need to rebuild our crumbling infrastructure, to build the housing we desperately need, and to address the existential crisis of climate change, we as a nation must get our priorities right, they added. We must invest in the needs of the American people, 
not spend trillions more on endless wars. The legislation to restrict funds for military action against Iran was passed last year in the House, but was later stripped from the national defense. Basically, what we have to do is tie Donald Trump's hands, right? And this isn't just on Congress. We, as individuals, we have to take action as well. We have to have some type of anti-war resistance that is committed to putting pressure on the administration for further escalation because once John Bolton left the administration, you know, it seemed like the prospect of war with Iran diminished exponentially. But now we're seeing individuals like Mike Pompeo in this administration and Mike Pence push Donald Trump to escalate further with Iran. Republicans, you know, with each Republican administration, it seems like they want to start at least one new war. And Donald Trump seems hell-bent on starting a war with Iran, even if he claimed that, you know, our leaders are stupid and they oftentimes get us involved in these never-ending wars. He's doing the same thing. And if you're still a Trump supporter who voted for him because he was a non-interventionist at times on the campaign trail, it's time for you to wake up and smell the fucking coffee. Donald Trump isn't on your side. Donald Trump, like all other Republicans, is a neocon. He is a neoconservative, and he wants war with Iran. One, because I think he believes that will help him get reelected. And two, because he's taking money from the defense industry. So even if on one hand, he likes to claim to be a non-interventionist, well, on another hand, he loves to boast about the strength of our military because he has an ego, and that really helps fuel his ego, right? So we should be trying to tie Donald Trump's hands, and yes, pressing for more transparency, and also the media should be doing their job here and also asking him, where are we going to get the money to pay for another war, right? Because we often ask progressives how they're going to pay for Medicare for all, but we never ask Republicans or Democrats for that matter how we're going to pay for more wars. We just live in a country that all of our priorities are asked backwards and it's getting to the point where it's comical, right? It's why comedy in the Trump era is dead. Because reality in and of itself is a parody. It's so strange. So I'll leave that there. Kudos to Bernie Sanders and Ro Khanna for being leaders here. Um, as they usually are, we just have to do what we can to sound the alarms and make as much noise as we possibly can, including taking to the streets. Because a war with Iran is something that we cannot let happen under any circumstances. Well, I've got some breaking news for you guys. This is terrifying. Iran has just claimed credit for an attack on a U.S. base in Iraq. And this is, of course, a further escalation and retaliation to the assassination of Quds Force leader Qasem Soleimani. So we don't have a lot of details about this currently. This is a developing story. But for now, what we do know will be uh, given to us by this NBC News article by Courtney Cube and Doha Madini, who report an Iraqi military airbase housing U.S. troops in Iraq's Al-Anbar province was hit by more than a dozen ballistic missiles from Iran on Wednesday local time, according to the Pentagon. It is clear that these missiles were launched from Iran and targeted at least two military bases, hosting U.S. military and coalition personnel at al-Assad and Erbil, the Defense Department said in a statement. It is unclear whether there is any damage to the al-Assad airbase, which President Donald Trump visited last month, or whether there were any casualties. Iranian state TV described it as Tehran's revenge operation over the killing of top Iranian general Qasem Soleimani, According to the Associated Press, NBC News has not confirmed the report. The state TV report said the operation's name was Martyr Soleimani. It said Iran's Revolutionary Guards Aerospace Division that controls the country's missile program launched the attack. So that is all that we know at this point in time. Donald Trump's administration received intelligence that this attack was coming, so he already was briefed on this. Currently, Mike Pence is briefing United States Senators. And since Donald Trump had already threatened them in the event they responded to his initial escalation, we can now anticipate the United States to respond because this will be a situation where both countries likely go tit for tat until we escalate into a full out war. So it almost seems like the prospect of war with Iran is a foregone conclusion. And now the question is, how big will this be if it does in fact happen, which I hope it doesn't? How big will this be? Will this draw in China and Russia, other powers? I mean, at a time when we have 11 years to act on climate change, 
we have a focus on these two countries bickering with one another. And this was all instigated by Donald Trump. So I actually literally found out about this on a live stream with Lance from the Serfs. You can uh, follow them on Twitch TV and you can see my reaction as it happened. Um, and it's just, it's terrifying. Again, we don't know all of the details. The story is still a developing story, so there will be more information that is released. But this is certainly not good news. We can expect now Donald Trump to craft a response, militarily speaking, and we don't necessarily know how far this will go. So, you know, this is certainly unfortunate, but expected. I mean, when Donald Trump assassinated Qasem Soleimani, the expectation was that they would retaliate because there's public pressure for them to take action. And now they retaliated, and now the United States will respond again. And as I stated, we don't know how far this is going to go. But it's not going to end well, and I hope that there were no casualties, and I really hope that Donald Trump just leaves this there, doesn't respond, and now is the time to have the anti-war protests and take to the streets. Call your representative, call your U.S. senator, let them know that war with Iran is not acceptable, and we do not give the U.S. government authority to continue escalations. Donald Trump initiated this exchange, they responded, now let's call it done that's that but since donald trump is an egomaniac and a man baby i don't suspect that that is going to be what will happen again he already threatened them on twitter with war crimes he said he'd target um cultural sites he kind of walked away from that we'll see but if i had to take a guess donald trump will most like likely respond in some way and this is just not gonna be good so I'll leave that there There, when I have more information. I will update you guys with that. Um, look for the pinned comment to this video. As we learn more, I will update that comment with more information. But certainly be vigilant and make your voice heard. War with Iran is not acceptable. Last night, we all were waiting for Donald Trump's response because, as many of you know, Iran claimed credit for ballistic missiles that were shot at two U.S. bases in Iraq, and we were eager to learn how Donald Trump would respond. Would he try to de-escalate, or would he respond in the unhinged manner that we all kind of expected him to respond? And all that we got was a cryptic tweet from Donald Trump that says, All is well. Missiles launched from Iran at two military bases located in Iraq. Assessment of casualties and damage is taking place now. So far, so good. So, I mean, we don't know what to take away from that. But today, it seems like I'm cautiously optimistic that maybe both parties are going to try to de-escalate. Although, I will say there is a caveat. At the time I record this video, uh, we just got word that two rockets reportedly landed in Baghdad's green zone which is a little too close to comfort to the U.S. Embassy. It's not necessarily surprising for this particular area, but nonetheless, we're all kind of on edge, and we're hypersensitive to every little thing that happens currently, although it doesn't necessarily seem like this will lead to anything at the time I'm recording this. But about the attacks last night, we did learn that Iran notified Iraq about the missiles ahead of time, which diminished the prospect of death and destruction, and, you know, it minimized the potential for U.S. personnel being hit, which is good. So now, two questions remain that I think have been answered, to a degree. One, is Iran done responding? Does this conclude their retaliation to Donald Trump's assassination of Qasem Soleimani? And two, what will Donald Trump's response be? So, let's go over the first. Is Iran done? Well, according to their foreign minister, Javad Zarif, he confirmed via Twitter that their response is, in fact, concluded as of now. He writes, Iran took and concluded proportionate measures in self-defense under Article 51 of UN Charter, targeting base from which cowardly armed attack against our citizens and senior officials were launched. We do not seek escalation or war, but will defend ourselves against any aggression. So, this is good news. The official position from the government of Iran is seemingly, we're done. Th that's it. We're concluding our response. Um, now, it's smart that they're stopping because any further escalation 
would, of course, provoke Donald Trump. We can't really predict his actions. It's very difficult. We know he's a man maybe with a huge ego who doesn't want to look as if he's weak. Um, he doesn't want to appear weak at all. So I'm glad that they're saying this is done. Although, you know, put a little bit of a pin in that because as Kyle Kalinske reports via Twitter, there are rumors that the popular mobilization forces, Iraq, largely Shia paramilitary group, are unsatisfied with the Iranian response to the U.S. Their deputy commander, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, was killed by the U.S. along with Soleimani. U.S. bases could potentially be targeted again. Now, let me remind you, this is not confirmed, of course, this is just a rumor, but it's important to stay vigilant regardless. However, again, the official position of the Iranian government is seemingly, we're done. So, that's good. Now, what is Donald Trump's response? Well, he released just under a 10-minute press conference today, and it was riddled with factual errors and lies, and it was almost unbearable to watch because he was doing more mouth-breathing than he usually does. But regardless, what he essentially signals to Iran and the world is that we are basically done escalating. Take a look. I'm pleased to inform you the American people should be extremely grateful and happy. No Americans were harmed in last night's attack by the Iranian regime. We suffered no casualties. All of our soldiers are safe, and only minimal damage was sustained at our military bases. Our great American forces are prepared for anything. Iran appears to be standing down which is a good thing for all parties concerned and a very good thing for the world. As we continue to evaluate options in response to Iranian aggression, the United States will immediately impose additional punishing economic sanctions on the Iranian regime. These powerful sanctions will remain until Iran changes its behavior. Iran's hostility substantially increased after the foolish Iran nuclear deal was signed in 2013. And they were given $150 billion, not to mention $1.8 billion in cash. Instead of saying thank you to the United States, they chanted death to America. In fact, they chanted death to America the day the agreement was signed. Then Iran went on a terror spree, funded by the money from the deal, and created hell in Yemen, Syria, Lebanon, Afghanistan, and Iraq. The missiles fired last night at us and our allies were paid for with the funds made available by the last administration. The very defective JCPOA expires shortly anyway and gives Iran a clear and quick path to nuclear breakout. Iran must abandon its nuclear ambitions and end its support for terrorism. The time has come for the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Russia, and China to recognize this reality. They must now break away from the remnants of the Iran deal, or JCPOA. And we must all work together toward making a deal with Iran that makes the world a safer and more peaceful place. We must also make a deal that allows Iran to thrive and prosper and take advantage of its enormous untapped potential. Iran can be a great country. Peace and stability cannot prevail in the Middle East as long as Iran continues to foment violence unrest, hatred, and war. The civilized world must send a clear and unified message to the Iranian regime. Your campaign of terror, murder, mayhem will not be tolerated any longer. It will not be allowed to go forward. The American military has been completely rebuilt under my administration at a cost of $2.5 trillion. U.S. armed forces are stronger than ever before. Our missiles are big, powerful, accurate, lethal, and fast. 
Under construction are many hypersonic missiles. The fact that we have this great military and equipment, however, does not mean we have to use it. We do not want to use it. ISIS is a natural enemy of Iran. The destruction of ISIS is good for Iran, and we should work together on this and other shared priorities. Finally, to the people and leaders of Iran, we want you to have a future, and a great future, one that you deserve, one of prosperity at home and harmony with the nations of the world. The United States is ready to embrace peace with all who seek it. So there you have it. Watching that, there's a little bit of a glimmer of hope that he's going to take his foot off the gas because there's a couple of things that he said which indicates that he's ready to de-escalate. Um, he says we have a giant military, of course. We spent $2.5 trillion upgrading our military, which, how are we going to pay for that? But regardless, I digress. Um, but we don't want to use that military if we don't have to. Um, he says he wants to work with Iran to defeat ISIS. That's a good indication. And he says, quote, the U.S. is ready to embrace peace. This is a good sign. Again, it's very difficult to assess that tensions will kind of cool down currently, but we are getting some good signs that maybe cooler heads will prevail, at least for now. Um, now, on top of that, he also wants a new Iran deal, which I just find hilarious because you tore up the original Iran agreement presumably because you didn't like that Obama was the one that got it achieved. Now, honestly, do you think that Iran is going to want to even come to the table with you? And do you think that you're going to get anything better than what Obama got, especially now? It's just laughable. But nonetheless, the sentiment is what matters to me at this point. The sentiment is, let's try diplomacy, maybe. It's not going to happen. It's not going to work. But let's try it. That's good coming from Donald Trump. You know, um, and on top of that, I can't not point out some of the outrageous lies that he told. Uh, he said that hostilities increased after Obama signed the Iran deal. No, that did not happen. U.S. and Iran relations were better because of that deal. Um, and on top of that, he talked about the money that we gave them. No, we gave them back the money that we withheld from them. So, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot of lies in there. There's a lot of mouth breathing that I just found insufferable and difficult to get through. It was irritating the shit out of me for whatever reason. But on top of all of that, you know, putting all of that aside, essentially, it seems like both sides are signaling their intent to de-escalate for now, assuming nothing else happens. So this is, I guess, a good sign. I'm optimistic, albeit cautiously so. Although, don't allow people in the media to give Donald Trump credit for this, which they will. You know, he will receive credit for stopping war with Iran when we have to remind everyone that this individual started this kerfuffle in the first place by initiating the assassination of Qasem Soleimani. Now, he tells us that the reason why this had to happen was because he was an imminent threat. Now, I don't find someone who's an imminent threat, you know, uh, I don't find that person that much of a threat if you're bragging to your buddies at Mar-a-Lago that something big is going to happen in Iran. You just chose to do this because you have an ego and maybe you thought that this would benefit you uh, politically. But we now know definitively, as if it wasn't already obvious, that there was no imminent threat. So in an interview with Jake Tapper on CNN, Tulsi Gabbard pretty much confirmed what we already suspected. No, there was no imminent attack. Donald Trump's administration did not sufficiently make the case that we had to take this action. It was a useless escalation that is putting us in a position where we are worse off and peace is less likely. So I'm going to let her explain. This is a clip from Tulsi Gabbard on CNN. Uh, we've heard Trump supporters and President Trump basically say, look, no American casualties and we took out a bad guy, uh, Soleimani, a terrorist leader. Uh, what would your response to that be? Uh, well, first, you know, I just came from the intelligence briefing that the administration came and brought to Congress. Really, they provided vague comments no justification whatsoever for this illegal and unconstitutional act of war that President Trump took. You don't buy the imminence, imminent no. attack against Americans? No. They failed to provide any compelling information to prove their point of imminence. Uh, and really, it, it, it brings us to the central question here, which is, uh, is our country's national security better off because of Donald Trump's actions and decisions? The answer to that is no, in two primary ways. Number one is, 
Iran is now in a position where they're not really abiding by any restrictions from the Iran nuclear agreement. They are continuing to escalate in speed towards developing their own nuclear weapons capabilities, creating a greater threat for us, to our allies and partners, and to the world. And secondly, because the troops that we have in Iraq now and the additional ones that this administration is sending there are no longer focused on what their, what their mission there really has been, which is to prevent a resurgence of ISIS and al-Qaeda. Mm -hmm. The announcement from the commander that came from there that said, we're not doing that anymore because now we have to shift all of our efforts and focus in a defensive posture against Iran and Iranian-backed Shia militia. So there you have it. They provided vague comments, no justification whatsoever for killing Qasem Soleimani, and, quote, they failed to provide any compelling information to prove their point of imminence. So this entire debacle, in other words, was started for no reason. We assassinated a leader of Iran, head of the Quds Force, for no good reason. So all of this could have been prevented. All of us worrying about war with Iran and the prospect of World War III for nearly a week could have been prevented if Donald Trump didn't choose to make this idiotic decision. So do not allow the media to give him credit for anything if we actually are escaping the prospect of war with Iran. Remind people, remind your peers that this individual is responsible for all of this. This escalation happened because of him. And do not let your foot off the gas. We still have to make sure that we take to the streets and demand peace. Call your senator, call your representative, make sure that they know that you do not consent to war with Iran. We can't just, you know, wash your hands of the situation and move on. I get that there are bigger issues, but the situation is still... I'm not going to say we're out of the woods yet, but I think that we're seeing a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel, possibly, but make sure that now you make your voice uh, heard and you say loudly and clearly that war with Iran is not acceptable. And at this point, I will notify you of any further developments. Hopefully the um, Baghdad Green Zone story doesn't turn into anything. But for now, it seems like we can all maybe breathe a little bit easier. Knock on wood. This desk isn't wood, but nonetheless, you get the sentiment. Yeah, I'll leave that there. So as many of you know, we ended 2019 on a very positive note with Bernie Sanders surging in the polls, having a phenomenal debate performance. And going into 2020, we are already seeing even more encouraging news with regard to Bernie Sanders' position in the polls. Now, I want to talk about a new poll from CBS and YouGov, but before we do that... Part of the reason why Bernie Sanders currently is doing so well is because he is able to generate headlines based off of his fundraising. Because as many of you know, we haven't talked about this yet, in the fourth quarter of 2019, Bernie Sanders blew everyone else out of the water. He raised a total of $34.5 million, just $11.5 million less than Donald Trump, who is the incumbent president who doesn't have to split donations with other candidates. And this all came from individual small grassroots donors, of course, as you all know. And Buttigieg, Biden, and Warren raised $24.7, $22.7, and $21 million, respectively. And this is all with the help of billionaire donors, or if you're Joe Biden, you know, with the help of a super PAC. And yes, even Elizabeth Warren has billionaire donors. I believe she has six currently. And on top of that, Bernie Sanders hit another milestone. He got all of his donations from 5 million individual donors. No other candidate is anywhere near reaching 5 million individual donors. That is absolutely astonishing. So before we even look at the polls, I want to tell you why this is so important. Because Bernie Sanders, by raising all of this money, especially through grassroots donors, it gives him staying power that no other candidate has. And even MSNBC of all places acknowledges that this is going to make him a force. Well, Joe, what it means is that Bernie Sanders has absolute staying power in this primary. He will be able to stay in this race as long as he wants to because his campaign is fueled by those small grassroots donations. That is what any candidate strives for is to have a campaign that is not built on large, significant donors who are maxing out. But on those small 15 to 20 dollar contributions, Bernie Sanders has that. He will be able to stay in the race until, you know, until the, the last primary votes, if he wants to, until the last state votes. Um, five million unique donations. That is nothing 
insignificant, especially when you have such a crowded primary. Um, so, you know, hats off to Bernie Sanders. I think some big pivotal moments that really worked in his favor were number one, Elizabeth Warren slipping a little bit in the polls around Medicare for all. And then, of course, AOC's endorsement was significant. He solidified his place as the far progressive candidate um, on the left who can sort of cultivate that large base. He can also bring in some of those younger millennial voters that other candidates have, have had a difficult time to attract. And I'll tell you, Joe, I've said this many times on this show. I'll say it again. As somebody who worked on Hillary Clinton's campaign in 2016, never underestimate Bernie Sanders. He has staying power. He has a, such a devoted base. Um, and again, you're going to see this guy, I think, continue to do, to do very well uh, as we go through the early states and through Super Tuesday. Now, I am genuinely shocked that they're even giving him credit. But, you know, I predicted that there would be a point where he would rise so much that they wouldn't be able to actually, you know, not represent the situation correctly like you have to acknowledge if somebody is doing well especially if they're doing that well like at the beginning of this race bernie sanders was surging and there were few pundits that actually acknowledged him as the front runner prior to when joe biden entered the race but now they're starting to realize that this close to iowa and new hampshire you have to acknowledge that Bernie Sanders is, in fact, a force to be reckoned with. Now, the reason why, irrespective of polling, it matters that the media tells people that Bernie Sanders is doing good is because oftentimes in politics, there's this thing known as the bandwagon effect, where if you're a voter who you don't really follow politics very closely and you just kind of make your decision based on whichever way the political winds are blowing, I know people like this, then oftentimes if you see that someone is likely to win or gaining, you might just want to support them because everyone else is doing it, hence why it's called the bandwagon effect. So if people actually see that Bernie Sanders has a chance, then they may just jump on board with Bernie Sanders because they view him as someone who is likely to win. So that's why even if you don't take into account polls, media coverage matters. Acknowledging that Bernie Sanders has raised 34.5 million, that really, really does matter. Now getting to the poll that is phenomenal, this poll by CBS News and YouGov demonstrates that he is the strongest he's been since Joe Biden entered the race when it comes to early primary states because he is now tied for first place in Iowa with Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg all at 23% each. But we'll get to average polls in a moment because it's even better when you look at his average position. And in New Hampshire, he is now officially in first place at 27%. Now, Joe Biden is in a close second with 25%. This is within the margin of error. Elizabeth Warren trails now with 18%. Pete Buttigieg slipped to 13% overall. But I do want to point out something. Even though Bernie Sanders is in first, and this is really good news, we should celebrate this, um, we were wrong. Political commentators in indie media were absolutely dead wrong about Joe Biden, myself included. We underestimated his performance. Now, we were absolutely correct about, you know, the frequency of gaffes and him making a fool of himself. But what we didn't take into account was whether or not the media would actually you know, hit him for this. And they're kind of giving him a pass. So there's this type of Trumpian effect where Joe Biden will say something stupid, sometimes offensive. He'll call someone fat. He'll say things that are racially insensitive. He'll say things that are just flat out incorrect. And he kind of gets away with it like Donald Trump. So that's one thing that I didn't necessarily predict. Um, so Joe Biden, like it or not, he is a force to be polling that high this late in the game. We can't not take him seriously. We would be fools, you know, to downplay the possibility of Joe Biden winning. But with that being said, I don't want to rain on this parade because Bernie Sanders is doing phenomenal. And one really crucial thing to acknowledge is that at this point in time, Bernie Sanders is doing better than he was in 2016. So long story short, you know, we were right about the gaffes, but we were wrong about the impact that they'd have on Joe Biden's campaign. He is in fact a threat, but there's a bit more information that I wanna share with you from this poll. So even though Joe Biden is a threat, he has the least enthusiastic base of support in comparison with other frontrunners. So Bernie Sanders does have the most enthusiastic base of support in Iowa, with 67% of voters enthusiastic about their choice. 
And the only candidate that even comes close to Bernie Sanders in terms of enthusiasm is Elizabeth Warren with 61%. Now, this is really bad news for Joe Biden, especially in states with caucuses, because enthusiasm is really going to be a key factor in their success here. But he does have electability still going for him. So in the state of Iowa, 38% of voters think that Joe Biden would win against Donald Trump to Sanders 29%. And in the state of New Hampshire, 36% of voters think that he'd win against Trump to Sanders 33%. So there's good news and bad news. The bad news is that voters still, I think, incorrectly believe that Joe Biden is the most electable. But the good news is that Bernie Sanders is starting to gain here. So based on this information that we have from this poll, um, we have to hammer away at this electability argument. We have to diminish this, I think, myth that Joe Biden is the most electable because I think he actually is incredibly vulnerable. I think he's more electable than someone like Pete Buttigieg, but he still would most likely lose to Donald Trump. So progressives and the Bernie Sanders campaign have really got to start to hammer this message home. And I think that we're starting to see that strategy play out because you have The Guardian publish a piece by Nathan J. Robinson, which is phenomenal, titled, Stop Saying Biden is the Most Electable. Trump will run rings around him. Did we learn nothing from 2016? Trump is savagely effective at destroying establishment politicians, and Biden would lose. And also in an interview with Los Angeles Times, Bernie Sanders even stressed this as well, saying, quote, if you are, if you're Donald Trump and you got Biden having voted for the war in Iraq, Biden having voted for these terrible, in my view, trade agreements, Biden having voted for the bankruptcy bill, Trump will eat his lunch. So that is a really important message now to hammer home. Disputing his electability should be, I think, our number one priority, because if we can dispute this notion that Joe Biden is the most electable, then when you take into account the bandwagon effect that's currently possible, we have the potential to convince Joe Biden supporters who are basically clinging to him because they believe he's the most electable to jump ship and go to Bernie Sanders. That's assuming that they don't prioritize policy, um, you know, over everything else. But if they truly believe that Joe Biden is the person they should vote for because he's the most electable, we have an opportunity to win them over. And we're starting to kind of gain some traction with regard to electability and Bernie Sanders' chances. We just have to continue to hammer that point home. But at this point in time, you know, we would um, downplay Joe Biden's chances at our own peril. He is a threat. At this point in time, if you are, you know, a month away from Iowa and New Hampshire and you're still a front runner, we would be idiotic to not take Joe Biden seriously. So we can't downplay him. However, with that being said, there's still more good news that I want to share with you. So at this point in time, it's January 6th, uh, Bernie Sanders is doing better than he was doing in 2016. And Joe Biden isn't as strong as Hillary Clinton was at this point in time. He is strong but not as strong as Hillary Clinton. And we almost beat Hillary Clinton in 2016. So let's look at aggregate polling data. So currently, according to Real Clear Politics polling averages, Bernie Sanders is about 10 points behind Joe Biden, but he is currently on the rise. Now, at this point in 2016, Hillary Clinton had a 20-point lead on Bernie Sanders. On January 6th, 2016, Hillary Clinton had 20 points on him. That's not the case with Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders this time around. Now, Bernie Sanders has also taken the lead in Iowa, according to aggregate polling data, although, you know, he is technically in a statistical tie overall with Pete Buttigieg. But at this point in time, in 2016, Hillary Clinton had a 12.5 point lead over Bernie Sanders, and she ended up winning in Iowa by only 0.2%, which is technically a statistical tie. In New Hampshire, Bernie Sanders is now officially in the lead and has a four-point advantage over Joe Biden, who is in second place. Now, at this point in time, in 2016, Bernie Sanders only had a 2.5 lead over Hillary Clinton, but ultimately ended up winning that state with 22 points. So there is real potential here. Now, some bad news. Biden is currently in the lead in the state of Nevada, and he has a nine-point advantage in South Carolina. Biden has an 18.7% advantage, although in California, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders are currently in a statistical tie. But in Texas, Joe Biden has a 12-point advantage over Bernie Sanders, and in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren is the one with the advantage. She is currently pulling ahead with about six points. So the overall takeaway is that Bernie Sanders is currently surging 
and he's doing better now at this point in time in the race than he was doing back in 2016. However, I don't want us to get overly cocky and arrogant. I don't want us to, you know, downplay Joe Biden's chances because there is a possibility that he could still become the nominee, which I think would be devastating because I do believe Joe Biden ultimately would lose to Donald Trump because those same people who will come out to vote for Joe Biden, they'd come out to vote for Bernie Sanders. But the goal and the way that we beat Donald Trump is we get disaffected voters to turn out, people who have never voted before, young people. We get them to turn out and then we can actually beat Donald Trump. I think that the Democrat, no matter who it is, is probably going to win the popular vote, most likely, right? Based on polling now. However, what we need to do is win the Electoral College. That's how we win. And we need someone who can win the Rust Belt. Joe Biden can't do that, having supported the trade deals that Trump will inevitably hammer him for. So I want us to be confident, but cautiously optimistic. And the overall takeaway that I want you to have from this is, okay, we're surging. Let's not just, you know, throw our hands up in the air and take a break. No, now is the time to really... Put your feet on the pedal and go, you know, 100% all in for Bernie Sanders because we have to defend what we've managed to achieve. And on top of that, we have to grow our lead still because it's not just good enough to lead and take first place. That's not good enough because understand that pledged delegates are awarded proportionally. So even if Bernie Sanders comes in first place with 27%, well, if Joe Biden really does come in second place in New Hampshire with 25%, they're not that far off in the grand scheme of things. So we have to play a really smart long game and acknowledge that this is a marathon. It's not a sprint. So we have to pace ourselves and acknowledge that, you know, these polling numbers are incredibly volatile. So we have to defend what we've managed to accomplish and continue to push harder and harder and make sure that our relatives know that Joe Biden is not the safe bet. He's the gamble. Bernie Sanders is the safe bet. Polling tells us that people in New Hampshire and Iowa still incorrectly believe that Joe Biden is the most electable and safest bet. We have to dispute that notion, and we have to do it in a very fierce and passionate way. Otherwise, we may not be able to convince Joe Biden supporters to jump ship, and they need to if they actually do want to beat Donald Trump. So overall, this is really great news. But whenever I share this great news with you, I don't want you to become complacent. I want you to be more encouraged to fight even harder because that's the political reality. The establishment isn't just going to let Bernie Sanders win easily. They're going to pull out tricks, possibly. They're going to bring out people in the media to smear him and try to stop him. You know, uh, I believe that establishment figures like Obama will try to stop Bernie Sanders. He's hinted that this would be the case, even though there's been articles saying, no, he'd support whoever's the nominee. Right, but we have to win first, and I don't believe they're just going to let him win easily. So this surge, even though it's good news, it does make Bernie Sanders susceptible to attacks from elites, not just from the Democratic Party establishment, but pundits as well. And we have to defend what we've managed to achieve and push harder to grow that lead. And I'll leave that there. Great news. So for those who are longtime viewers of The Humanist Report, I have talked for years now on this program that we need electoral reform. It's not necessarily something that I overemphasize, but I always touch on it. Like, we need to make sure that we have more than just two parties because the two-party duopoly isn't working. It's just a bunch of ghouls who serve the same financial interests that are ruining the country, ruining the planet. And we need more options because two options isn't enough, especially considering they're not really, you know, that different. So AOC, a member of the squad, is someone who has been doing, I think, a phenomenal job at representing progressives in Congress. She's not perfect, but nobody is. But she said something that really speaks to one of my issues with the political system, that there aren't enough choices. And because of our two-party duopoly, we're essentially in the situation where conservatives get their own party and centrists and the left and socialists are forced to share a party, which it doesn't make for a great political alliance, given that, you know, we don't just have different goals, but our goals are diametrically opposed to the goals of centrists. We want Medicare for all. They're actively trying to stop. Medicare for all. We want tuition-free public colleges and universities, and they don't even want to go that far. You know, we'd be 
lucky to find someone that supports the first two years of uh, community college being free, for example, in the Democratic Party, who's a centrist. So we butt heads a lot. And this is causing a lot of friction within the Democratic Party. And it's allowing Republicans to dominate. And it shouldn't be this way. So AOC expressed this. And I wanted to share what she had to say because she essentially summarized my take over the last you know, several years. It's been my take forever. But for those of you who have been listening to the podcast, you know that I've been saying something similar to this. So as Quint Forgey of Politico writes, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said in an interview published Monday that Democrats nationwide can cultivate too big of a tent, asserting that she and her party's 2020 frontrunner, former Vice President Joe Biden, would be in different political parties in any other nation. Asked for a profile by New York Magazine about what role she might play as a member of Congress should Biden capture the White House, the freshman House Democrat from New York responded with a groan. Oh God, she said, in any other country, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party, but in America, we are. A spokesperson for the Biden campaign did not immediately return a request for comment. Yeah, my thoughts exactly. Um, we should not be sharing a party with centrists. Because conservatives, you know, they get to share a party with people that they largely agree with. I mean, there are certainly differences uh, within the Republican Party. there, I think the biggest difference is likely the neocons and libertarians. Um, but also you have, you know, fundamentalist evangelicals in that party, along with individuals who are more nationalistic and xenophobic. But at the end of the day, they all have intersecting goals, whereas that's not the case in the Democratic Party. We are pushing for changes, radical reforms that conflict with what the Democratic Party wants because they have donors that don't want to enact the changes that we want to enact because that threatens them existentially, healthcare being the number one example. Um, but when she says that, you know, we can cultivate a tent that's too big, yeah, Democrats boast about, you know, the Democratic Party being a big tent, and they don't realize that that's not actually a good thing. When you have a tent that's too big, that leads to ideological incoherency, right? It becomes difficult to assess what any particular individual believes in the Democratic Party. Because when you vote for a party, people use, and political science research indicates this, people use party labels as information shortcuts. So when you see Democrat, you know, you can assume a number of things about them. They are in favor of the women's reproductive rights. They're in favor of LGBTQ rights, for example. When you see a Republican, that means they're going to be more fiscally and socially conservative. Um, but I mean, it's getting to the point now where when you look at that Democrat label, you don't know what it means. You could be looking at someone who is a uh, centrist, maybe even center right, or someone who's a socialist. And that just doesn't make for a good political alliance, especially considering our ideologies are butting heads with one another, right? I mean, it's not even like the Democratic Party is comprised of reformers like Elizabeth Warren. That in and of itself would be an issue. But we need radical change and we can't get radical change so long as we are being dragged down by democrats and i've said this before and there's really no way to facilitate this but democrats need to be the de facto right-wing party and we need a new progressive party either that or we need party realignment where all of the conservative democrats flee the party and they go to the republican party and then the centrists and the right-wingers are forced to duke it out why should we have to battle with people who are not going to fight for what we believe in. We want Medicare for all. They're trying to stop Medicare for all. But Republicans and centrist Democrats, they both don't agree with Medicare for all. So they should be in the same party. They're the ones who should be sharing that ide ideological space, not us, right? So that's why my hopes is that if we don't get electoral reform in the near future, one, we keep pushing for ranked choice voting because that's an easy reform to enact at the state level, especially, you know, via ballot initiative. But two, I hope that in the event Bernie becomes the nominee, this catalyzes party realignment, where centrist Democrats are so, you know, against the idea of a social Democrat running the party that they leave the party. They join the Republican Party. Now, if this were to happen, this is something that rarely happens, the media would freak out because they would see this as, oh, well, Bernie is destroying the party. But every once in a while, that has to happen, right? You have to have party realignment so that way, you know, you have overlap 
with the voters of the party that they're supposed to represent and the actual, you know, elected members of that party. It's incredibly important. So that's what I hope. But, you know, long story short, AOC is absolutely explaining very eloquently what I've said for years now. There, now, there's a little bit more that I want to share. Ocasio-Cortez also offered criticism in Monday's story for congressional Democrats, accusing her party's lawmakers of too often working to appease the interests of their most conservative members. She has frequently broken with House Democratic leadership since assuming office in January 2019. For so long, when I first got in, people were like, oh, you are going to basically be a Tea Party of the left? And what people don't realize is that there is a Tea Party of the left, but it's on the right edges, the most conservative parts of the Democratic party, Ocasio-Cortez said. So the Democratic Party has a role to play in this problem, and it's like we're not allowed to talk about it. We're not allowed to talk about anything wrong the Democratic Party does, she continued. I think I have created more room for dissent, and we're learning to stretch our wings a little bit on the left. Ocasio-Cortez said the Congressional Progressive Caucus, of which she is a member, should expel lawmakers without adequate liberal bona fides charging that they let anybody who the cat dragged in call themselves progressives. There's no standard. That is exactly it. So the takeaway is that we don't have to just settle. We can keep pushing for change. Now, ideally, I would love to see, you know, a system where we have proportional representation. We increase the district magnitude from one to three, which just means that instead of us voting for one member of Congress, you know, maybe we vote for one member of Congress, but the candidates with the top three scores or top top three percentage totals all go to Congress, right? Um, we need change. But in the short term, ranked choice voting is something that actually can work. It has made a Green Party Senate candidate viable in the state of Maine. Um, but on top of that, in the event Bernie Sanders becomes the nominee, that is our path towards party realignment, possibly. Again, there's no way to really facilitate this, right? But you, we can just... Hope it happens if he's the nominee. I don't think it would happen right away. But if he becomes president, you're going to see individuals possibly like Joe Manchin want to flee the party because they feel as if that's what's going to help them become more electorally viable in the future. So um, at the end of the day, AOC is absolutely right. We should not be forced to share a party with centrists. Why doesn't the far right have to share the same party with in individuals like Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi? We're forced to share when they should be forced to share. So the message is that we're taking over this party and anyone who isn't progressive, who isn't a leftist or a socialist, social democrat or democratic socialist, I don't care. But if you're not on the left and you're in the center, you leave because we're taking over this party because we need a party that actually represents the left in this country and not just two right wing parties, one center right, one far right. So, with less than a month away from the Iowa caucus, Bernie Sanders is very clearly changing his electoral strategy, and he is implementing a technique that um, I've been wanting him to use for months now. He's attacking. <laughs> he's going after Joe Biden, and, you know, he's not just thoughtlessly attacking him. He's being, I think, really sophisticated in the way he approaches, you know, a negative... A discussion about Joe Biden, and he's being realistic. Joe Biden is not someone who's the most electable about Donald Trump. And I recently made the case when we talked about Bernie's surge that we have to really hammer away at the fact that Bernie Sanders, not Joe Biden, is the most electable, and that Joe Biden really is susceptible to all of Donald Trump's attacks that worked on Hillary Clinton. He's vulnerable, right? We risk losing to Donald Trump in the event Joe Biden is the nominee, but yet you have a lot of voters still, you know, basing their support on Joe Biden, primarily because they believe he's the safest choice going up against Donald Trump. But our duty now is to educate them and let them know that Joe Biden actually is a risky bet. You're gambling with him. We just ran a moderate four years ago, and if we do it again, we're not going to get a different result. Most likely, Joe Biden will lose. It's not a foregone conclusion. Nobody is. But if we want the best chance to beat Donald Trump, we have to, you know, excite the base. And the only person who can do that is Bernie Sanders. So thankfully, not only is he going on the offensive, but he is arguing against Biden's electability and making the case for himself, which is something that now is a really important thing to do. So, I mean, 
even though I've been pushing him to, you know, attack Biden and hit him hard, it seems like Bernie Sanders was waiting for the right time to strike, and a month before Iowa, maybe he just feels like this is the time to strike, but regardless, I think it's important, and what he said here in an interview with Anderson Cooper on CNN was incredibly important and crucial, because people who only watch mainstream media, they're now only hearing this for the first time, because, I mean, if you tune into indie media, you know that we don't believe Joe Biden is very electable right? But mainstream news consumers, they don't hear that. They've never really thought. They've just heard that, you know, Joe Biden is the most electable. So they haven't really thought about this thoroughly. But when Bernie Sanders paints this picture for them about what a Trump versus Biden, you know, general election would look like, I think it really will hopefully wake people up. Take a look. Uh, you said recently about Vice President Biden, uh, uh, his record, you said to the Washington Post, quote, it's just a lot of baggage that Joe takes into a campaign, which isn't going to create energy and excitement. Um, is there something specifically you were referring to in terms of baggage? Sure. I mean, look, I, Joe and I are friends, and, and I truly like Joe. But what is imperative is that we defeat Trump, the most dangerous president in modern history. And that means you're going to have to have a huge voter turnout. You're going to have to get working people excited. You're going to have to get young people excited. Joe Biden voted and helped lead the effort for the war in Iraq, the most dangerous foreign policy blunder in the modern history of this country. Joe Biden voted for the disastrous trade agreements like NAFTA and permanent normal trade relations with China, which cost us millions of jobs. Do you think that's going to play well in Michigan or Wisconsin or Pennsylvania? You know, Joe Biden has been on the floor of the Senate uh, talking about the need to cut Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, Joe, Bi Joe Biden uh, pushed a bankruptcy bill, which has caused enormous financial problems for working families. So if we're going to beat Trump, we need turnout. And to get turnout, you need energy and excitement. And I just don't think that that kind of record is going to bring forth the energy that we need to defeat Trump. So that is incredibly important, and my only recommendation to Bernie Sanders is to create ads and run those types of ads, you know, explaining all these horrible things that Joe Biden did and how Trump will use them against him in states like, you know, New Hampshire, South Carolina, Nevada. In fact, I would prioritize Nevada and South Carolina because his ground game in Iowa and New Hampshire currently, I think that will suffice, but he has a lot of ground to make up in South Carolina and he's still falling behind in um, Nevada. So if you really show to voters that Joe Biden is a risk and he probably won't be able to excite the base enough to get out the vote, then I think maybe you can change some minds. Now, it, I think that there's going to be a number of Joe Biden supporters that will be loyal to him because they just are more centrist, ideologically speaking. But a lot of people, they're just casual consumers of, you know, uh, political news. They don't necessarily follow it too closely. I think that we can get some of them. Like, we're not going to be able to convert a lot of Joe Biden supporters, but for people who are primarily basing their decision to support Joe Biden on electability, I do believe we can get a lot of those people. And I think a substantial portion of Biden's base of support is comprised of people specifically supporting him because they think, well, you know what? I just want to get Trump out of office, and I think Biden is our best bet. We have to wake those people up and make them see that we're playing a dangerous game, you're rolling the dice, you're gambling, you know, with your fate, and we've got to get Trump out. Now, I was actually surprised at how many things Bernie Sanders decided to bring up. The vote for the Iraq war, uh, the trade deals, how do you think that's going to play in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, uh, the bankruptcy bill. He talked about how Biden wants to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. Brilliant. This is incredibly important because that's how you convert people who are older. Because, you know, aside from that electability myth that people are, you know, basing their support of Biden on, there's also a generational divide. Let's face it, older people don't like Bernie Sanders, but they love Biden. Younger people love Bernie Sanders, but dislike Biden. So we also need to try to convert over older voters. Um, and if they know that he most likely will team up with Republicans to cut Social Security. That's another way you get them to jump ship 
and support Bernie Sanders, who has, you know, vociferously said, I will not cut Social Security. In fact, we've got to expand Social Security, lift the, the cap on taxable income. So this is really important. And I'm so thankful that Bernie Sanders is finally, you know, explaining to people, educating them that Joe Biden is not the most electable. Now, on top of that, we have this from Robert Costa in The Washington Post, who writes, Sanders also cast Biden as part of the political elite, cozy with Wall Street and unable to confront major financial institutions because of his record, such as his support for the bank bailout in 2008. People are tired of the traditional types of campaigns in which candidates like Joe Biden are running to wealthy people's homes and raising large sums of money, Sanders said. Again, really important. We're still in an anti-establishment era in American politics. So doing you know, business as usual, all of these private fundraisers in the Hamptons with elites, that isn't going to suffice. And the media isn't going to talk about this. So it's incumbent on candidates like Bernie Sanders and also commentators like myself to point out that if you truly want representation, if you want someone who's going to fight for you, you can't vote for someone who's doing fundraisers in the Hamptons, probably promising rich people not only positions in his administration, but promising them policy concessions, or at least to fight for them. You know, this is the way that politics works. There's this cozy relationship with the elites, and then you vote in a politician and they do nothing, and then when you look at who gave to their campaign and who they associated with, oh, you see, it makes sense. You know, we didn't vet Obama in 2008. I didn't vet Obama. That was the first time I was old enough to vote. And I voted for Obama, and I thought that he would actually bring about true change, but I wasn't paying attention to all of the money that he was raising from Wall Street, right? So we have to make sure that people know about these kinds of things, and candidates have got to educate voters about this, and Bernie Sanders is now carrying out the right strategy. He's saying pretty bluntly, you know, Joe Biden is not your best bet. If electability is what you care about, you are making a mistake to go with Joe Biden. So effectively, what Bernie Sanders is communicating to voters here is that Joe Biden is going to lose to Donald Trump. That's basically what he's trying to say, because all Trump has to do is run as a pseudo populist once again. And I think that people are going to uh, not necessarily buy it, but believe what Trump says about Joe Biden. So what we need is an excited base, as Bernie Sanders said, who will come out and vote for Joe Biden. If you're someone who's, you know, on the fence about voting because you live in a state with voter ID laws and you work, so you're not going to have time to stand in line and vote for Joe Biden. You know, if you hear Donald Trump say that he's cozy with elites and he supports all these trade deals that sends jobs overseas, do you think that as a self-interested voter, you're going to take the time to come out and vote for Biden? Of course not. We saw how this played out in 2016 with Hillary Clinton. So we don't even need to go through these hypothetical situations with Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. We've seen what happens when you run a moderate against Donald Trump. He wins. So Bernie here is making a powerful case against this myth that Joe Biden is the most electable. Nobody is a foregone conclusion, but if we truly want a good chance of beating Trump, Bernie is the safest bet, not Joe Biden. Joe Biden would most likely lose to Donald Trump. At a fundraiser on Tuesday, Joe Biden doubled down, or actually he tripled down technically on the claim that once Donald Trump is out of office, all of a sudden, Republicans will have this epiphany and they'll start actually being good people. Yeah, um, it's such a laughable claim that I literally can't say it with a straight face because we all know that that's bogus. Now, he said this once. We talked about this, and I think it was July or August. He said something similar to that. He loves praising Republicans, so I've lost count at this point. But in November, he also said this. With Donald Trump out of the way, you're going to see a number of my Republican colleagues have an epiphany. Mark my words. Mark my words. Okay. Now, he has since extended that theory to include another Republican, a very specific Republican who has been the most obstructionist, Mitch McConnell. So <laughs> it's not just regular Republicans, congressional Republicans who will have this epiphany once Trump's out of office. It's also Mitch McConnell. He's also going to change once Trump is out of office. All right, so let's... <laughs> Let's see what he said. Um, this is kind of long-winded, but I want to give you the full context. So this is his remarks. Think about what you're willing to do personally. You're in a group 
whether it is a tennis group, a golf club, a sewing circle, a reading group, wherever it is, and you got nine people in the group, and five of them have a view on where, in fact, we're on, on a position, and four on the other side. And one of the five thinks that, well, maybe the four are correct, but unless they're pretty damn sure that if they go with that other group, they're going to win. It's not worth dying on a small cross. So what do you do? You stay away. I predicted once we found that we took back the house, you would find members of the House of Representatives who thought that some of the policies being proposed by the administration were wrong start to step up. No sense in stepping up when you're going to lose anyway, because then you're in real trouble with your own outfit. But it becomes worth it if you step up and it actually changes policy. That's what you are beginning to see in the House, and that's what you begin to see in the Senate. I'm not suggesting all of a sudden everyone's going to project a new sense of courage and political courage. What I'm suggesting is that the dynamic changes when the right vote, as opposed to the vote you don't agree with, becomes a possibility if you vote for it. But when, <laughs> this is so long-winded, but when it's not a possibility if you vote for it, there's no sense in doing it because all you're doing is going to be ostracized by your outfit and nothing's going to change. That's just the way human nature works. Think about it in your own lives. That's how politics works. And so that's why I think you're going to see even Mitch McConnell changing some ideas or being more, how can I say, mildly cooperative. Now, he reportedly paused. I don't have the video of this. He paused before he said that, and then the crowd kind of laughed. So he was watching his words, but he is literally saying he believes that once Trump is out of office, even Mitch McConnell will be more cooperative. And what he's trying to basically, I think, say is that the social pressure to conform will be gone once Trump is out of office. Um, except the problem with that is I'm not sure if Joe Biden missed the Obama years, but Mitch McConnell is the individual who literally stole a Supreme Court vacancy from Obama. Oh, wait, Joe Biden was actually part of Obama's administration. But yet here he is saying that Mitch McConnell is going to change. Mitch McConnell is now bragging about being obstructionist, and he has stated multiple times that in the event a Supreme Court vacancy becomes available this year, during an election year, he's going to fill it. So he's just being obstructionist, bragging about it, and then boasting about what he managed to accomplish. He blocked Obama from putting federal judges on courts, and now he's allowing Donald Trump to stack those positions. Now, one in four federal judges have been appointed by Donald Trump. So for Joe Biden to say this, there's really no way to, you know, uh, describe what he's saying here as other than just insanity like you can't even be kind here like this is moronic to say something like that what an imbecilic thing to suggest does he honestly believe this like i i genuinely believe that joe biden actually thinks this like he's that naive and it's not necessarily because you know he thinks that mitch mcconnell is a good person but because joe biden himself is very conservative he identifies with republicans he praises republicans constantly so, I mean, why not just run as a Republican, Joe? I get that you were already part of a Democratic administration, but your policies are closer to Republicans in many ways than they are to the left. I mean, you side with them when it comes to being against Medicare for all. You're not in favor of tuition-free public colleges and universities. You've been incredibly hawkish throughout your career. You are arguably still a segregationist. You're just a bad person who's only looking out for yourself. You have an ego. Like, just join the Republicans. You keep praising them. You clearly want to be with them. Join them. We don't want you in the Democratic Party. You do not represent what the left wants. You will not excite young voters. You will not galvanize the electorate. Move on. We're tired of you and your kind fucking up the Democratic Party. Like, this was a party that used to be actually progressive. And now, I mean, the line that separates Democrats and Republicans increasingly is becoming more and more blurred. And, I mean, he honestly believes that he's going to be able to get Republicans to work with him. And part of this, I think, is naivete, but another part of this is more cynical, a more cynical thing that you could take away. I 
think that he wants to actually fulfill a lot of their agenda. He's indicated before he wants to cut Social Security. He is incredibly hawkish. So when he says that Republicans will work with him, really, I don't necessarily believe, believe that he thinks that Republicans will come to the Democratic Party's side. I think that what he's kind of signaling to us in a roundabout way is he's going to meet them more than halfway. That's the only thing that we can take away from this, because a rational human being who sees how obstructionist the Republican Party was during the Obama years, who sees how you know, obstructionist Mitch McConnell is and brags about it, wrote a book bragging about this. I mean, there's no other thing that you can take away from this. If you genuinely believe, Joe, that they're going to work with you, it's because you are carrying out their agenda and not a left agenda. So I can tell you this, people who are young are not going to be excited to vote for Joe Biden. People who are disaffected, who haven't voted, are not going to suddenly come out and vote for Joe Biden because they believe that he can defeat Donald Trump or they want to defeat Donald Trump. People don't vote against people. People vote for people and for people, politicians with actual platforms and a policy agenda. So, I mean, Joe Biden, it's like a train wreck, right? You're seeing an iceberg and we're all on the Titanic and we're just sailing right towards it with Joe Biden. If he wins, Trump wins, right? If he's the nominee, I truly believe that Trump will mop the fucking floor with him. This individual is naive. So I am sick of Joe Biden. The fact that he is still a front runner in January of 2020 should scare everyone. Thankfully, the good news is that we have a reason to be optimistic since Bernie Sanders is currently surging. And there's recognition from the mainstream media they actually is a threat and he can win so let's all make sure that we go that extra step that extra mile to make sure that bernie does win because if we truly want to defeat donald trump and avoid war with iran joe biden's got to be defeated it's that simple so when it comes to the left's electoral strategy against joe biden i have previously said that we need to emphasize that he is not electable going up against donald trump so we've got to hammer that home and um, make sure that people know that if they are voting for Joe Biden in hopes that he's going to be the best, most safest bet to defeat Donald Trump, they're in for a rude awakening come November. But another thing that we also have to hammer away at is another one of his vulnerabilities. He is painfully corrupt. Like Hillary Clinton, he's in the pocket of Wall Street. He has a super PAC. He's doing private fundraisers with elites in the Hamptons, and he's taking money from some of the most egregious people in the country. So it took decades for him to finally admit that his crime bill didn't work out too great, to say the least, right? Um, and he only did so begrudgingly because he knew he had to because he's running for president. So you can't run on the crime bill being good in 2020 when we all see what a demonstrable failure that was. But the problem is what he says now is meaningless because what he's doing now indicates to us that he hasn't actually changed. He's taking money from individuals who are private prison profiteers. And that's not even considering all of the money he's raked in from private health insurance companies who literally profit by ripping us off. So a new report by The Intercept's Ida Chavez actually explains who is helping to prop up Joe Biden's campaign. Quote, after decades of championing legislation that escalated mass incarceration, former Vice President Joe Biden released a criminal justice plan seeking to reverse key provisions of the 1994 crime bill he helped write. The wide-ranging proposal, which he rolled out roughly a week before the second Democratic presidential primary debate in July, would ban private prisons and reduce incarceration. It also takes a clear stance on those who are cashing in on the prison system, stop corporations from profiteering off of of incarceration, his website reads. But one of Biden's top fundraisers, Michael F. Nydorf, is the CEO and chair of Centene, a health insurance company that's a major player in the prison healthcare market. Prisons and facilities in 16 states have contracted out their healthcare services to Centurion, which is owned by the $60 billion health insurance company, according to its website. This year, Nydorf has also donated to the National Republican Senatorial Committee, the Democratic Congressional 
Congressional Campaign Committee and the re-election campaigns of Republican Senators David Perdue, Lindsey Graham, and Susan Collins, as well as Democratic Senator Gene Shaheen, FEC filing show. Biden's platform vows to end the federal government's use of private prisons by building off an Obama-era policy that was rescinded by the Trump administration, along with ending the use of private facilities for any detention, including detention of undocumented immigrants. Neither the Biden campaign nor Santine responded to a request for comment. So, I mean, what do you think this is going to lead to? If Santine and someone who is the CEO of that company profits off of private prisons, do we honestly trust that Joe Biden is going to do away with private prisons? He has this reform currently, but he'll introduce it, theoretically speaking, if he's elected. And then what's going to be one of the first provisions that he chips away at? The ban on private prisons. And guess what? There's going to be a lot of other stooges in Congress that will go along with him because this individual is a ghoul that's bankrolling individuals in both political parties, including the DCCC. So, I mean, you can't take anyone seriously who claims that they are supporting a policy, but they're taking money from these special interests that financially benefit from that. Like if Bernie Sanders was talking about Medicare for All, but taking money from health industry CEOs and doing fundraisers at their mansions, I'm sorry, I wouldn't believe that he was serious about Medicare for All, because this is... A corrosive influence. These fundraisers influence elected officials, right? When you hold a fundraiser for someone running for president, oftentimes you want something in return. I mean, it's no coincidence that all of these rich people end up getting uh, jobs as ambassadors to somewhere, both in Trump and Obama's administration. This is just the way that politics works, and we've be become, you know, accustomed to it. Like, it's, it's not just a coincidence that that happens, right? This isn't a direct quid pro quo, but it is a quid pro quo, functionally speaking, because they donate and then they get a job. That's how Betsy DeVos was able to buy her way into Donald Trump's administration. So, of course, that's why this individual, Michael Nydorf, is giving donations to Joe Biden. You know, he's a top fundraiser to Biden because he knows that like a good little stooge, Joe Biden is going to do exactly what he wants. And look, Joe Biden before had previously admitted that it's human nature for you to be influenced by someone who helps you out, who donates to your campaign. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock, but all of a sudden we're supposed to believe the opposite, that taking all of this money doesn't corrupt you. This is what Pete Buttigieg says. This is what Biden often refers to. And this is what the media, uh, you know, implies. They don't ever actually point out the fact that the reason why things are the way that they are is because of money in politics, right? We have economized the entire electoral process. It's about money. So if you want a policy issue to be passed, then it's about lobbying, how much money you spend to get a politician elected and to lobby them to do the right thing or the wrong thing in many instances, in most instances. So, I mean, this is just, this is disgusting, right? Why believe Joe Biden at this point? If you're still a Joe Biden supporter and you know that he's taking all of this money, why would you believe that he's going to fight for you? The answer is, I don't think you, assuming you're a Biden supporter watching this, are dumb enough to believe that. I just don't. I don't believe anyone is that naive. What I think people are basing their votes and support for Joe Biden on is this myth that he's the most electable to take on Donald Trump. But let me remind you what happened in 2016. Donald Trump called out Hillary Clinton's corruption, and he was right about that. And he hammered her. He hammered her for her horrible record. You know, the trade deals that she supported, such as NAFTA, the TPP, and he called her out for being a warmonger. Now, he can't necessarily, you know, uh, call Joe Biden a warmonger now and have the credibility to, to do just that since he's currently trying to escalate into a war with Iran. Nonetheless, though, people don't like the Iraq war. So Trump can still say that I was right about that and Trump was wrong about or Biden was wrong about that. So, I mean, what do you say in this situation other than if you think that Joe Biden is most electable? You're fooling yourself, and if you think he's going to represent you, you're not that naive. Wake up. Joe Biden is going to lose to Donald Trump, and in the event he's able to beat Donald Trump, nothing will get accomplished that helps normal Americans. Maybe he does a couple of good things. Maybe he reverses some of the things, some of the executive orders that Donald Trump put in place. But if you honestly believe that he's going to change your life, you are horribly mistaken unless 
you're already very wealthy. And after, you know, four years or eight years of Joe Biden, can you imagine after people are even more, you know, demoralized and desperate? Who are we going to elect then? Steve King? Roy Moore as president? I mean, it's only getting worse. We went from George W. Bush to, you know, um, Donald Trump. Presidents who make Ronald Reagan seem like a libtard cuck. So, I mean, we've got to wake up at some point and realize that we are voting against our own self-interest. If we keep electing corporate Democrats, you have a chance to elect someone who is going to have revolutionary change on his agenda. Maybe he's not going to be successful. Maybe he only gets 10% of his agenda through Congress. But regardless, 10% is much more than we can expect from Joe Biden, even assuming he passes half of his agenda, which he won't. So, I mean... What do you say about this? Joe Biden is a fraud, and really, he should be running as a Republican because that's basically what his actions indicate he is. He's more of a Republican than even a liberal. He's not a lefty. I'm just sick of him. The fact that he's still leading in the polls is incredibly frustrating at this point. But this, you know, this isn't over yet. Bernie is surging. Bernie can win. We just have to work to work that much harder to make sure that Bernie wins and Biden isn't the one who comes out on top. Because if he is the nominee, we're all fucked and Donald Trump gets another four years. Something is happening currently in America. The winds of politics are starting to change. And we're starting to see the establishment collectively realize all at once that Bernie Sanders might actually be able to pull this off. We've seen, you know, inklings, an article here and there, but just over the course of the last week, to get a sense of just how quickly they're all realizing he actually has a chance, I mean, look at all of the articles that came out, ranging from articles in Newsweek to the Wall Street Journal of all places, who don't just think he can be the nominee, but think he can be the president. They're realizing that... They're having to uh, grapple with the prospect of a Bernie Sanders nomination and a Bernie Sanders presidency. And it's really nice to see. And at some point, I'm sure that they're going to, you know, bring out the big guns like Obama and Clinton to campaign against Bernie Sanders so they can somehow stop his momentum. But for now, it's really nice to see them all collectively recognize for the most part that Bernie Sanders might be unstoppable at this point. Now, of course, nothing is a foregone conclusion. I always add that caveat. You know, he still has to fight really hard for it. We all have to work really hard for this goal. And the fact that I'm sharing this good news to you, with you, shouldn't, you know, encourage you to let your foot off the gas. You should, in fact, make more calls for Bernie Sanders, knock on more doors. That should be our response, because the higher he goes the more vulnerable he becomes because the establishment and capital, they're not just going to roll over and die. They're not going to let him win the nomination without a huge fight. So we have to work for this. However, still, knowing what Bernie Sanders has behind him, 34.5 million in fundraising in that fourth quarter of December, 5 million individual donations, almost, uh, what is it now, 1.5, it might be higher, million individual donors, and a gigantic movement, all galvanized, all extremely enthusiastic, they're kind of realizing that we might not be able to stop him. Now, someone who is no friend to progressives, David Axelrod, he's actually a former Obama administration official, he now works for CNN, he kind of admitted that, look, if I had to choose anyone, you know, currently... I think that Bernie Sanders is in the best position. Now, this is the only clip I could find, so hopefully it's not too unbearable. But what he said here was incredibly interesting. I wanted to play his remarks so I could talk about it. Let's talk talk more about the positioning that you just mentioned there, because this is let's put up the CBS poll. Joe Biden uh, is in a three way tie with Bernie Sanders and and Mayor Pete Buttigieg um, for first in Iowa. Whose position of those three would you rather be in? Uh, you know, that's that's really hard to say. I think Sanders probably because, I, you know, he is almost invulnerable here. Uh, he has he raised more money than anyone else. He's got a very committed core of supporters. Uh, he's going to do reasonably well in Iowa. He could win Iowa. Didn't people yeah, but write him off well to the heart attack? Yeah, they did. I mean, I think the, the thing that we should we relearn this lesson every four years, which is 
don't jump to any conclusions uh, about Iowa or a presidential race too early. There are too, too many dynamics. Things change. He's come back smartly. So he goes on to talk about Elizabeth Warren, and I tried to find the full clip, but I can't find it anywhere. CNN hasn't posted it. Um, but that really, that says so much to me. What he said there tells me that even if, you know, we're correct to assume that the establishment will, you know, pull some type of trick, bring out Obama to campaign against Bernie Sanders, it might be too late. He says Sanders is almost invulnerable here. He raised more money than anyone else. He's got a very committed core of supporters. And that's exactly it. It's still the case that Joe Biden is the front runner when you look at aggregate polling data. Nationally speaking, he's polling in first place. But Bernie Sanders is doing really well in early primary states. He could very well win Iowa. He is positioned currently to win New Hampshire. And in the event he wins those first two states, hopefully that can kind of improve his odds in Nevada and South Carolina. But going into Super Tuesday... He has a really good shot, and there's a lot of delegates to be won on Super Tuesday, which I believe is March 29th. And on that day, like, we're looking at a situation where we could see, you know, if not a standout emerge, the top two or three candidates kind of come out on top, and the field could really be narrowed. People are realizing in the establishment that anything that they did before to try to stop Bernie Sanders, the smears... The allegations that he's a hypocrite because he wrote a book and is now a millionaire, none of it worked. Because the reason why Bernie Sanders supporters support him is because of policy. Now, you might not necessarily know that if you tuned into mainstream media because there was literally a guest on there who claimed that his supporters don't actually care about policy. In fact, we'll play that clip really quickly before I talk about that. The idea there was going to be a progressive battle between Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. It was never something to have much resonance with me because that presumes that Bernie Sanders supporters are supporting him primarily for policy purposes. And that's not really what's going on. A lot of his core base support like him because they see him as sort of a political and democratic savior type character. See, it's such a ridiculous statement to make because the opposite is actually true. The complete opposite is true. Bernie Sanders has such a loyal following because we are committed to policy. The reason why none of the media smears and attempts from political elites to, you know, bring him down haven't worked is because at the end of the day, we are voting based on policy and there is nobody in that race that comes anywhere near the policies that Bernie Sanders is offering. And even if anyone is a relative second in terms of progressivism in that race, he's the one with the movement that can actually get these policies codified into law, which is why nothing that they tried to do has been able to stop Bernie Sanders. And that's really encouraging to see. Now, as usual, again, I want to stress that we do not have this wrapped up just yet. If he becomes the nominee, then we have to battle to get him into the White House. But what I want you to take away is that we can do this, but it's not over. We have to fight. We have to work hard and understand that the establishment's collective realization that Bernie Sanders can win is more motivation for us to work even harder because now they're going to try to switch it up possibly to try to throw something else at us we don't know what types of curveballs that they have what types of smears they have but we do know that capital and big money they're going to be aligned in their hatred against bernie sanders and they're not going to let us win easily we all know that by now so we've got to push harder and acknowledge that this is all the more reason to fight even harder because what we're doing is fighting for something that will actually lead to real change in this country. And we have a real shot. So in 2016, when we all felt like, you know, we did all of this for Bernie Sanders, advocacy, canvassing, phone banking, text banking, we did it for nothing, right? That was the general sentiment, but you didn't. Back then in 2016, all of your work was just a down payment to what we've built today, which is a bigger, broader movement. It's more robust and our chances are better than ever. We can do this. We just have to keep on fighting and fight even harder now. Good work, everyone. Charles Pena of Fox Business News reacted to Bernie Sanders' Q4 fundraising numbers, and specifically, he reacted to who is donating to Bernie Sanders the most. 
and his reaction was hilarious, I think. So he talked about this on his program on Fox Business, but he also tweeted about this initially, saying, Say what? Bernie Sanders' $34.5 million fourth quarter fundraising is impressive but worrisome. Top occupation? Teachers. American teachers embracing socialism. So what are they teaching our children? <laughs> I love this tweet so much. Um, I don't know, math, reading, history. He's missing the mark here. He doesn't understand why teachers are supporting Bernie Sanders because they are working Americans. Um, but I'm going to play the clip and then we'll break it down as to why so many working Americans are donating to Bernie Sanders in large numbers, even if they don't have as much money as elites. Take a look. Wowza, Bernie Sanders raising $34.5 million in the final quarter of the year. The haul from nearly 2 million donors far exceeds the like of Pete Buttigieg, but that's what, he had a great quarter himself. Very impressive. So where's Sanders' money? Where's it coming from? Well, the most common employers were folks who worked in Amazon, Starbucks, Walmart, Target, the U.S. Postal Service. But here's a little nugget that really got me worried. The most common occupation? Teachers. I mean, teachers are backing the socialist candidate. I mean, when you think about that, you have to ask yourself, what are they teaching our kids? I want to bring in Democratic strategist Kevin Chavos, along with uh, Trump 20 senior legal advisor Jenna Ellis. Uh, Jenna, I, you know, when I saw that, I'm like, teachers? They're, they're backing the socialists? What country is this? I'm confused. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Charles, I don't think anyone, regardless of any profession, should be backing socialism whatsoever. And so I think that's a problem, regardless of what profession we're talking about. But uh, I think what's most interesting about this, and it probably speaks a lot more to the influence of the uh, union bosses over teachers more than anything else. And so I don't think that when you look at, um, you know, the average teacher in America and uh, what they are for and what they're promoting, um, I think it speaks a lot more to the union influence. And, you know, Bernie has gotten some of those endorsements. But if you look at unions otherwise, President Trump certainly has um, a lot more of the backing of other types of unions. And I think that we're going to see that for the individual um, average American, regardless of profession, yeah. you see so much in those small campaign dollars that are going to President Trump. Well, let's over talk about Trump else. in a moment, Jenna. And first of all, folks, I do have breaking news. Uh, it's official now. Biden's uh, fourth quarter numbers are in. He raised $22.7 million, slightly better than he had in the third quarter, Kevin. Uh, but here's the thing. You consider Bernie's numbers. You consider Mayor Pete uh, almost $25 million. You consider over, over $12 million for, for Andrew Yang. And I'm looking at these numbers, and I'm saying to myself, the, the Democrat establishment is losing their grip. It feels like grassroots, your party... Uh, they don't want the, these manufactured, uh, you know, candidates that the establishment sort of rubber stamps. There's obviously an appetite for change. And look, Bernie Sanders has been a fundraising dynamo. Um, even in 2016, he had this sort of reputation and raised more money from small individual donors than anyone had before. And now he's broken that record. So it's more of the same for him, and it is very impressive. But I would say about Joe Biden, I mean, his numbers are pretty encouraging for him to come in, as you said, at uh, 22 million, almost 23. And he's starting to coalesce top Democratic fundraisers around his campaign, um, those who supported Biden and Hillary. Um, let's not forget that Hillary in 2016 outraised the Trump campaign and the, the RNC. Right. And I think we'll, we'll see... Joe Biden begin to get that support. So these numbers are good for him. And I would say the biggest loser is Elizabeth Warren, who um, yeah, continues to Yeah, there's no doubt drop. about that. I, I agree with yeah. you. But let me ask you, though, if you take, take Mayor Pete, Bernie, and Andrew Yang, that, you know, uh, over $50 million. It, there's a message being sent to your party, though. That's the question I'm saying. Is anyone paying attention to it, or will they continue to, to borrow your work to coalesce around, uh, around Biden? I'll take this one. They will never coalesce around Bernie Sanders. They may one day begrudgingly acquiesce if he does become the nominee, but not all of them, and not without a huge fight. So getting to the substance of that clip, there wasn't much there, but um, I found it interesting because they were trying to speculate about why Bernie Sanders gets all of this support from working people and namely teachers. It's not that complicated. It's really simple. But yet the Trump legal advisor, which I wouldn't want to be a legal advisor for Donald Trump at this point. But nonetheless, she um, suggested that maybe, you know, teachers only support Bernie Sanders because unions and they're influencing him to uh, influencing them to support Bernie Sanders. No, you're overanalyzing this. Occam's razor, ladies and gentlemen. It's a simple explanation. The reason why 
teachers support Bernie Sanders is not because they have some nefarious agenda to implement socialism in classrooms. I mean, that's stupid. If they wanted to do that, they could already technically do that, right? But the reason why teachers love Bernie Sanders is because he is looking out for them. Politics is about self-interest. We vote based on who we believe will improve our lives. It's why most rich people are economically conservative and most working class people, broadly speaking, support social democracy, policies like uh, Medicare for all, tuition-free public colleges and universities, right? We all, at the end of the day, we may care about everyone, but we look out for ourselves. Teachers are supporting Bernie because he understands teachers are underpaid and teachers are being taken advantage of. And if we truly want to create a thriving economy, then we should probably pay the people who are training the next generation better, right? Now, on top of that, it's not just teachers. The reason why Walmart workers and Starbucks employees support Bernie Sanders is very simple. They're struggling. Bernie is the only individual who understands the economic situation that they are in because Bernie Sanders talks to people. He doesn't spend time taking selfies with people. He actually engages with people. They share their concerns with him. They share the issues that they're dealing with. And then he responds accordingly with policy solutions. Now, you don't have to take my word for it. You can watch all of his town halls. They're all broadcasted on his YouTube channel. And people will come to him with issues that they can't afford insulin. They lost their job. They're pregnant. And they can't afford, you know, the medical bills. This is what Bernie Sanders does. He listens to people. That's why they know that he's going to represent them because nobody else does this in politics. I mean, think about Walmart workers. These individuals are worked so hard, but yet they're paid so little. They have to go on food stamps. I mean, look, I, when I graduated college and I was going through grad school, I had to work at Walmart temporarily because that was the only way that I could make ends meet. And I had food stamps while I was working at Walmart. And, it, you know, you have this sense that you really are being exploited. It, you can never take a moment to just breathe. You finish the finish a project and you're talking with one of your coworkers, then you get yelled at by a manager because, you know, how dare you stop for a moment? They just overwork you. You just feel underappreciated. And Bernie Sanders, unlike all the other elitist politicians running, acknowledges the inherent worth in all of us as human beings. We're not just cogs in the machine of capitalism or Walmart or Starbucks. Like, we are each individual human beings with immense value and worth. Therefore, we should be accommodated for the work that we do and treated like human beings. We should be given a living wage, $15 an hour plus. We should be given health care that's free at the point of service so we don't have to worry about dying if we can't afford copays. If we don't have insurance, we should be able to go to school and not worry about debt right? I have anxiety when I think about all of the college debt that I've accumulated. I don't know that I will ever be able to pay it off unless it's canceled like Bernie Sanders, then I'm going to live with this forever. A lot of us kind of feel this way. It's really demoralizing and it produces a lot of anxiety. So, I mean, it's, it's just so funny to me and it demonstrates how out of touch they are on Fox News that they have to speculate why teachers and Starbucks employees and Walmart workers would support Bernie Sanders. It's obvious because he cares about them. How do you not see that? How do you not see why the only candidate in the race who has consistently had a record of fighting to improve the lives of working Americans is popular? I mean, it's obvious why his message resonates with the normal Americans. Because he cares about them and not just in some politician patronizing way. He's listened to their concerns. And he wants to improve their lives. He's just genuinely a good person. He's not perfect on policy. I don't agree with him on absolutely everything. He's not a saint. But he's trying. He's listening and responding with policy. Nobody else is doing that. Nobody else is consistently releasing policies like this. You have Elizabeth Warren putting out policies, but none of them go as far as Bernie Sanders. So... It's not a surprise that teachers and working Americans are donating to Bernie Sanders in large numbers. That's obvious. It's because they want someone who's finally going to represent them. And Bernie Sanders, obviously, is the only person who is going to do that. That's as simple as it is. I mean, you don't have to overcomplicate it and try to, you know, dissect what these people might be thinking, look into the psychology of teachers. I mean, it's really simple. They support him because he cares about them. Period. End of story. <laughs> and, like, to think that... Charles Payne is probably making like six or seven figures to do political analysis where he can't even understand why teachers would support Bernie Sanders. 
Embarrassing. A Republican member of Congress named Doug Collins recently appeared on Fox News and, you know, Lou Dobbs and him were conversing about the current situation in Iran and they were outraged at the fact that Democrats dared to try and attempt to rein in Trump's authority to wage war with Iran. He already doesn't technically have the authority if you believe in the Constitution, but nonetheless, you know, they were outraged that Democrats would try to rein him in, and Doug Collins said something that is so stupid, so profoundly idiotic, that I couldn't not talk about this because it really speaks to a broader issue with the Republican Party. They are downright fucking insane. Take a look. ...about uh, constraining his authorities as the commander-in-chief uh, vis-a-vis Iraq. How... <laughs> How venal, how vapid can one party become? <laughs> you know, Lou, it just is amazing. I mean, if it wasn't so sad and serious with our country to have Nancy Pelosi, I did not think she could become more hypocritical than she was during impeachment. But guess what? Surprise, surprise. Nancy Pelosi does it again, and her Democrats fall right in line. One, they're in love with terrorists. We see that. They, they mourn Soleimani more than they mourn our Gold Star families who are the ones who suffered under Major. Soleimani. That's a problem. But also look at this. In 2011, when President Obama went into Libya and stayed longer than, quote, they thought you know, the war power says he should stay. They said nothing. In fact, she actually excused it and said, this is just what, you know, presidents do. Let me say, as someone who has a very real constitutional issue with the War Powers Act to start with, I mean, this is just another, again, blatant hypocritical act by Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats because they don't like the president. Democrats are in love with terrorists. Unbelievable. This is supposed to be a representative of one of two of the biggest parties in the country. And he literally just claimed that the other party loves terrorists. Unbelievable. But I mean, the thing about this is it's only slightly more bombastic than usual Republican commentary on political issues because this is a party that is downright fucking insane. I mean, if you listen to Noam Chomsky, he talks about this. This party has marched so far to the right that they've fallen off a cliff. They're almost irredeemable. The only way that this party is salvageable is if we see party realignment if Bernie Sanders becomes the presidential nominee and enough centrist Democrats flee and go to the Republican Party and so much move there that they like watered down the overall, you know, Republican message and platform. But I mean, they're just they're too far gone. This is why there's so much deadlock in American politics, aside from the money in politics, because we have one of two parties that is completely fucking insane. He literally just said Democrats are in love with terrorists. I mean, what a stupid thing to say. And then he says, we see that they mourn Soleimani more than they mourn gold star families. First of all, it was the president who you shill for, who got in a literal spat, a public dispute with the Gold Star family in 2016, so shut the fuck up there. And second of all, we're not mourning Soleimani. Nobody in America even knew who the fuck Soleimani was before Donald Trump decided to assassinate him. We don't like the idea of Donald Trump, an unhinged buffoon, escalating with another country. We don't want another war. But we denounce the prospect of war. He interprets that as, uh, oh, well, Democrats, they just, uh, they love terrorists. Now, to be fair, he's talking specifically about elected Democrats, and I'm no fan of them. I can't stand them. I hate most Democrats. But do you honestly believe that Nancy Pelosi is in love with terrorists? Really? You honestly believe that, Doug? I mean, what an idiotic thing. Like, we have people like Ilhan Omar in Congress who will say the most benign thing about Israel, and all of Congress throws a conniption fit, but then this moron will claim that Democrats love terrorists, and will there be any consequences for his actions? Will there be, you know, um, a censure? Will they vote to condemn him? Nothing. It is always the left who is held to a really high standard, and the right can say downright batshit fucking insane things, and, you know, nobody really bats an eyelash because they've gotten us accustomed to their insanity. This is the norm from them. So if they were to stop saying crazy things, that would actually be 
more, you know, shocking to a lot of people because they just keep saying stupid things. So if you keep saying crazy thing after crazy thing, eventually you get used to it. It's the same thing with Donald Trump. Like he lies so much that it's no longer shocking that he tells like five lies throughout the course of a 10 minute speech. He is just, he does it so much that you become used to it. It's a normal thing, you know, but we shouldn't be accustomed to these types of phenomena. Like when a Republican party official, especially one who's elected, says something like this, we should all collectively laugh at them when they do things like Jim Inhofe and, you know, bring a fucking snowball to the floor of the Senate to disprove climate change, we should all collectively laugh at them. It should go viral because it shows how insane this party is. Now, he talked about Obama in Libya. I was against Obama's action in Libya, but he says, as someone who has a very real constitutional issue with the War Powers Act to start with. Now, I honestly don't know what he means. I don't know if he takes issue with the provision in the Constitution that says the president should get approval from Congress. Um, or must, in actuality, get approval from Congress to start war. I don't know what he means, but if I interpret what he's saying more charitably and that he actually supports the War Powers Act, then, look, you can be against Obama, right? I think that that's good, and I would agree with you if you said I was against Obama's action that he took unilaterally in Libya. Fine, no disagreement there. But the problem is that there's no consistency. If you're against Obama but also against Trump and his unilateral actions, then there's no story here. But you're giving Trump a pass, but Obama doesn't get that same pass. In fact, you and Lou Dobbs were talking about how it's crazy that Democrats want to rein in Donald Trump's power to wage war unilaterally. So, I mean, what side are you on? But we know what this is. This is team sports to him. Republicans can never, ever do anything wrong, even if I technically don't agree with it. Um, but Democrats, doesn't matter. They are always, always wrong. They're never right in any circumstance ever. I mean, what a hack. This is quintessential political hackery right here. So, I mean, what a stupid segment. It's not surprising, again. But nonetheless, we just can't turn away when we see Republicans say things like this because we can't become accustomed to this level of insanity. The party is fucking insane. They are the party of death and destruction. That's what their policies indicate. And, um, yeah, they need to collapse as a party because if we truly want to survive as a species, Republicans must be defeated permanently. We have to defeat them. We can't work with them. We can't put them in our presidential administrations. They have to be defeated permanently. Period. Over the past decade, the world of right-wing media has blessed us with so many gems. I mean, over the last few years, we got God's Not Dead 1 and 2 by Pure Flix. On top of that, we recently got Trump Jr.'s book, literally called Triggered. And funny story about that, the RNC actually purchased thousands of copies so it would appear on the New York Times bestseller list. Yeah, that's embarrassing. But now we get a new gem. We get No Safe Spaces by Adam Carolla and uh, Dennis Prager of Prager U fame. And this is essentially a feature length version of the anti SJW videos that we see on YouTube by Tim Pool or Dave Rubin. So they're going to go on Tucker Carlson, promote this new documentary. I, I think it's a documentary, I believe it is. And um, they're not really even going to do a good job at promoting their documentary because as you're going to see, they're going to spend a large portion of this video talking about fish, literally. Um, yes, fish. <laughs> and on top of that, they're going to basically pretend to be in favor of freedom of speech, but this is nothing more than pseudo-advocacy. They're not really saying anything. This is vacuous. It's frankly cringeworthy, but nonetheless, let's watch and then we'll discuss this train wreck. Freedom of speech is America's most distinctive right. It's a free country member. They used to say that back when it was. But it's also the most embattled of all of our rights. In the name of safety and sensitivity, a coalition of big tech monopolists, universities, and political activists are fighting to limit what you're allowed to say and punish those who stray outside the accepted boundaries. Well, last year, comedian Adam Carolla, who was a genius, and radio host Dennis Prager, also kind of a genius, teamed up to release No Safe Spaces, a kind of brilliant documentary about the American anti-speech movement. Here's part of it. Israel sent me into the Soviet Union when I was 21 years old because I knew Russian and Hebrew, and I was sent in to smuggle out the names of, of Jews that I would find in the Soviet Union and to smuggle in religious items and so on. And I really experienced 
what most people in the West have never, ever experienced, life under a totalitarian regime. It's a great movie. And if you want to see it in theaters, you still have a chance to do that. The film is having a limited re-release this weekend, thanks to strong support from grateful viewers. Adam Krola and Dennis Prager join us tonight. Gentlemen, thanks both for coming on. I haven't talked to you since the film came out. To start with you, Adam, what was the risk? Did anyone tell you that you're not allowed to say the things you said in the film? Was it, did the irony loop come complete? Uh, it is interesting when people are talking about free speech, but it's free speech that they want to vet and make sure it's okay for them to hear before you can say it. I did notice the clip was all Dennis Prager, by the way, so I'm going to forgive my yeah. I'm going to forgive my publicist on this. Yeah, he, he, this resentment is a very big problem. <laughs> well, I, th I think he may be is, close to one of my. It's producers. a big problem. We 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 enjoy each other too much. We're, 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 we're looking for problems. Yes. Well, we're so, still in kind so of the newlywed the phase you, of our relationship. But, if, but even, even newlyweds, they may sublimate it, but there's, there's usually tension. If you could identify one thing that divides you bitterly, what would it be? Uh, he likes gefilte fish. And I wouldn't feed that stuff to my cat. No, you said you did feed it to oh, your I cat. I did. I did feed it you to my cat. You said your cat liked it. I asked you specifically how it went over in the Corolla home. You said the cat loved it. Yes, he gave me a jar of gefilte fish. Yes, I did. I, By the way, fish isn't supposed to be in jars. Just, just for no, your information, it's no, supposed it's, to be on platters. No. Or it's supposed to be or above aquariums. a fireplace right. in a hunting lodge. <laughs> your aquarium. That's right. Exactly. By the way, so this was a danger working with him. Better? Yep. No, the so, I mean, fish so is as bad as it's ever first... been. No, well, that's right. Oh, right. I don't think that there's any room for improvement there at all. But the question of speech, do you think the country has become freer or less free in the last year? No, it, it's, it, it, it's less free. There's no question. Uh, and you could, the, there's an interesting proof. Read the reviewers in the mainstream media, not to mention left-wing media, on how they have contempt for the film. When the film features liberal after liberal, including President Obama, speaking about what's going on on campuses. But they, they, they can't even acknowledge that this is going on when they see the film, which is about the suppression of speech. So I have Obama a slightly different feeling on Obama's. it. Yeah, okay. I, well, here's what I think. I feel like the pendulum is starting to swing back the other direction. I'm in the comedic community, and I feel a lot of my cohorts in the comedy world starting to push back against it because they're at their saturation level. And I feel like the group that started this thing is starting to double down on it, starting to really work it harder. It's sort of uh, the same subject as racism. As racism fades from our society, a certain group is tripling down their efforts to make sure it's alive and well, or at least we think uh, it's alive uh, and well. Right. Oh yes, racism has definitely gone away, folks. Black Americans are no longer being killed by the police, racially profiled, locked up at higher rates than their white peers, and they finally have reached parity economically with their white counterparts. Amazing. Thank you so much, Adam Carolla. I mean, what an idiotic thing for a rich white dude to say. And I'm sorry he's going to say that this is predictable because he probably thinks that the left thinks everything is racist, but denying the existence of racism is a form of racism. It is. Because even though we've made improvements in certain areas, that doesn't mean that the issue has just gone away. Like, to say something like that, you have to be so ignorant, so detached from reality that you're clueless. I mean, and Adam Carolla, I've never liked him as a comedian, even before I found out that he was a Republican, uh, because he is one of those people, like we all know one of these people, they're in our friend and social circles, that loves to tell jokes, not necessarily because they're inherently funny, but because they like to hear the sound of their own voice, and then they just look at you, so you laugh, and you have to fake laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna laugh at your stupid fucking dad joke, you dumb motherfucker, talking about fish over and over and over. Okay, we get it, move on. Like, they don't know when to move on from the joke, and because they elicited the reaction from you that they wanted, the laughter, then they keep going while not realizing, based on social cues, that your laughter was fake to begin with. I mean, this is someone that it's just so irritating to me. I can't stand him. He's just a whiny, um, 
dare I say, snowflake? Now, anyways, regardless, moving on to their documentary. So Dennis Prager claims that we have less speech now. And, you know, I technically agree, but not necessarily for the reason that he cites. But the reason why we have less free speech in this country, the main reason he cites is because look at the reviews for their movie. Critics didn't like it. Therefore, we have uh, less free speech because we're saying free speech is under attack and the people who watched this movie said the movie was shitty. Therefore, point proven. Is that really the argument that you're going to make? And he says that, you know, since I cited individuals like Barack Obama and, you know, liberals, that should prove to you that I'm being impartial. So how dare you say that my movie is stupid. Dude, the SJW narrative has been long, long dead. And at this point, anyone on YouTube who still talks about it is beating a dead fucking horse. I mean, who is entertained by dozens of videos talking about how Captain Marvel is an SJW movie or pandering to SJWs? Who cares? I mean, this initially started as a movement of people online denouncing snowflakery on the left, which sure, there's a degree of snowflakery on the left and the right, but it has devolved into a movement where they've become the snowflakes that they've once denounced. Tommy Lahren, who claims to be, you know, very anti-PC, feigned outrage on Fox News because someone in Connecticut, I think it was a public official, a city council member, dared to kneel during the national anthem. I mean, you all are fucking hypocrites. You have no room to talk. Now, Adam Carolla chimed in and he let us know that there's a little bit of hope because, you know, his friends in the comedy world are starting to push back by, like, talking about SJWs because uh, Ricky Jervis got pushback for doing edgy jokes about trans people that we've seen a hundred times. He's an Apache helicopter. That's how he identifies. I mean... The reason why you're getting pushed back is because comedy is something that's subjective, right? Like, I I think that a lot of things are funny. Even offensive jokes can be funny. But if it's not funny, then people will call you out because it's not funny. And I think that a lot of uh, comedians mistake people not laughing at their jokes as outrage. But it's just not funny. I mean, trying to say that you identify as an attack helicopter to own trans people. That's not funny. We've heard the joke a thousand fucking times. So you have to come up with new material and actually do better. And you're not doing that, right? So anti-SJW comedy, sure, I think it could theoretically be funny. I've laughed at certain anti-SJW jokes admittedly before. But the reason why we're not laughing at you, the reason why we're not laughing at Jerry Seinfeld is because you guys are boomers who aren't funny. Generations change. What one generation finds funny, another generation will not. Like, this is largely generational. I find people in my generation really funny, right? Because they kind of have this the same worldview as me. I laugh hysterically whenever I listen to Chapo Trap House. I love Jake Flora as a comedian. So, I mean, like, you can't say to me that, oh, well, if you don't like my jokes, and he's not necessarily arguing this to be clear, but, oh, there, if you don't like that comedians are offensive and, you know, pushing the boundaries, then you're just snowflakes and you hate free speech. No. Offensive jokes can work if they're intelligent and you make a good point. It just, it has to be funny. And you, Adam Kroll, of all people, you're not funny. Like, who finds you funny? Other than Dennis Prager and Tucker Carlson, who tried to rein you two in on that, you know, robust fish conversation. I mean, this was such a stupid and cringeworthy segment. Um, I'm surprised that Fox News put it up on their YouTube channel, but Fox News is shameless. So, yeah. Now, here's the thing about freedom of speech. The individuals like Dave Rubin, um, you know, Tucker Carlson, Dennis Prager, Adam Carolla, who constantly freak out about free speech, they don't actually care about freedom of speech. They don't care about the First Amendment because there are actual violations of the First Amendment that is the government's crackdown on freedom of speech that they don't even acknowledge are happening. Did Tucker Carlson address Trump's recent executive order that would limit free speech by punishing advocates of BDS? Has Adam Carolla defended fellow comedian Jake Flores when Homeland Security paid him a visit for making an offensive joke about ICE on Twitter? Has Dennis Prager defended a Texas school teacher who was literally fired because she wouldn't sign an Israeli loyalty contract? I mean, did any of these dipshits condemn Donald Trump for saying that we should literally jail people for burning the flag? No, the reason why they're talking about SJWs is because this is a narrative that 
complements the right wing worldview. They want to make it seem like they're in favor of freedom, but you're not. You're not addressing the actual uh, stifling that we're seeing to free speech, largely done by Trump's administration. And if you truly care about freedom of speech and the First Amendment and other constitutional issues, how are you not talking about the NSA spying on Americans, collecting our metadata? Like, there are so many issues that you can promote that would prove to us in a better way that you care about freedom and liberty, but you don't. You're hucksters. So what you have to do is, you know, replicate the strategy that has built up a lot of audiences on YouTube. You attack people on college campuses for being offended by something. I mean, give me a break. Get the fuck out of here. This is so played out at this point. And for anyone who hasn't seen it, I will link to it in the description box. Watch my PragerU parody because I talk specifically about how these grifters profit off of this anti-SJW narrative. It's incredibly lucrative, which is why it hasn't died down and why we're still talking about uh, SJWs on college campuses, even when it's not relevant at all. When Donald Trump is president and when we're on the brink of war with Iran and the world is going to be engulfed by catastrophic climate change if we don't take action in 11 years. Like, that's not the real issue. The only way that the right can appeal to young people is by trying to be edgy and denouncing SJWs, and it's no longer working for them. Um, it's just sad and pathetic at this point, but I will absolutely laugh at their expense because even though I don't find Adam Carolla funny, I do find his grift funny. He didn't make it in comedy, or he certainly doesn't have a career in comedy now, but seeing him, you know, uh, grift and be a right-wing uh Dave Rubin type of figure, it definitely is entertaining, and uh, I think that Mike Huckabee at this point has a more robust comedy career than Adam Carolla, so there's that. <laughs> Okay, I am fully aware that the establishment is afraid of Bernie videos are getting a little bit redundant for me at this point, but you've got to understand, I have been challenging these ghouls now for almost five years, and to see them squirm at the prospect of a Bernie Sanders presidency, like, I am, I'm truly enjoying it. And I find it fascinating, like, the tactics in particular that they are trying to use to dissuade people, you know, away from supporting Bernie Sanders. Um, it's honestly bold that they haven't changed anything since 2016. Like, you would have expected them to adapt and their tactics against Bernie Sanders to evolve, but I think that they're starting to realize that nothing they say will dissuade people, especially young people, from, you know, uh, supporting Bernie Sanders. We're going to commit to supporting him because he's the only person who has a really transformative agenda that opts for structural change and he has the movement to facilitate this change in actuality, get what he wants codified into law. So I want to read you one last uh, story on this subject for now from the Associated Press. This is by Steve Peoples and Alexandra Jaffe who report increasingly alarmed that Bernie Sanders could become their party's presidential nominee establishment-minded Democrats are warning primary voters that the self-described Democratic Socialist would struggle to defeat President Donald Trump and hurt the party's chances in premier House, Senate, and governor's races. The urgent warnings come as Sanders shows new signs of strength on the ground in the first two states on the presidential primary calendar. Iowa and New Hampshire, backed by a dominant fundraising operation. The Vermont senator has largely escaped close scrutiny over the last year, yeah right, as his rivals doubted the quirky 78-year-old's ability to win the nomination. But less than a month before Iowa's kickoff caucuses, the doubters are being forced to take Sanders seriously. Former Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, previously a senior aide to President Barack Obama, warned Democrats that Sanders' status as a Democratic Socialist and his unwavering support for Medicare for All won't play well among swing voters in the states that matter most in 2020. You need a candidate with a message that can help us win swing voters in battleground states, Emmanuel said in an interview. The degree of difficulty dramatically increases under a Bernie Sanders candidacy. It just gets a lot harder. Right, so I'm assuming that he believes we need someone more moderate. Like Hillary Clinton or Tim Kaine. <laughs> Like, it's honestly amazing to me that they haven't changed their 2016 fear-mongering at all. They're still using the same electability argument against Bernie Sanders, even after their argument is a proven failure. We put up a moderate, and she lost. 
why haven't you even tried to change your message even a little bit? Like, I honestly believed that they weren't dumb enough to use the same exact argument against Bernie Sanders. And they are. Like, I, like I'm not under this delusion that Democratic Party strategists are competent. I think they're some of the dumbest people in America, to be honest. But I at least thought they had the self-awareness to not try out the same fear-mongering that we need a centrist to win, but they're doing that again after it was a proven catastrophe and Donald Trump is president. I mean, you really have to be confident in yourself to use the same argument twice. But I mean, it's just astounding that someone like Ron Emanuel, of all people, one, thinks that anyone takes him seriously and cares what he has to say, but two, believes that all of a sudden this time in 2020, we're going to accept his electability argument that we need a moderate to take on Donald Trump. Sure, Jan. I mean, what do you say about this? These people are clueless. No wonder why Democrats under Obama lost more than a thousand seats. They have no strategy. And what I like is he suggests that Bernie Sanders being at the top of the ticket is actually going to hurt down ballot Democrats. No, what we need is high turnout. And part of that, like a really huge portion of the electorate that we need to increase voter turnout so we win, are young people. Riddle me this, genius. Who is the candidate that is running away with the youth vote? It's Bernie Sanders. I believe uh, Bernie Sanders got more votes from young people than Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump combined in 2016. So do you honestly believe that down-ticket Democrats will be worse off? with Bernie Sanders at the top of the ticket? Because if he is at the head of the ticket, more people will be inclined to come out and vote, and since they're already voting for Bernie Sanders and excited, odds are they're going to vote for, you know, Democrats in the Senate and the House as well. Like, I just, I'm genuinely shocked that they still think this will persuade people. It's not. You guys lost. We tried it your way in 2016, and that was a proven failure. Donald Trump is president. So you're not going to persuade a single person by making the same fucking argument and ch just changing nothing. I mean, what do you say? What do you say? So I apologize for constantly making videos about how the establishment is afraid of Bernie Sanders, but I truly am enjoying this. It's not a foregone conclusion that he will win the nomination. And yes, we have to work very hard for it, but I am enjoying watching these people, you know, shake at the prospect of a Sanders nomination after all of the things that they put us through, after their incompetence and hubris led to Donald Trump winning. I'm excited to see them fear because, you know, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. You're not going to dissuade us from supporting Bernie Sanders. Again, he's the one who has the best shot. Nobody's a foregone conclusion against Donald Trump, but if you honestly believe that a moderate increases our odds, you really are out of touch and more clueless than even I initially thought. So I am admittedly enjoying the mainstream media and Democratic Party elites come to terms with the prospect that Bernie Sanders may very well become the Democratic Party's nominee. But someone else who a lot of us hadn't thought about and what he's going through, you know, in this uh, coming to terms process is uh, Donald Trump. Because like it or not, he may have to face Bernie Sanders. And we all know Trump is the most afraid of Bernie Sanders. Um, this became clear back in 2016 when after he basically had the Republican Party nomination on lock, he floated the idea, I think on a late night show, of debating Bernie Sanders, a Trump versus Bernie debate. It was trending on Twitter, there was a lot of hype for it, and then Bernie Sanders agreed, sure, I'm down, we'll debate. But then all of a sudden, Trump backed away from it. He is afraid of Bernie Sanders, and unlike all the other Democratic Party presidential contenders, he attacks Bernie Sanders the least, and it almost seems like he goes out of his way to avoid attacking Bernie Sanders at times. Like when Bernie Sanders first announced that he was running again in 2020, Donald Trump said nothing negative about Bernie Sanders. So, I mean, it's evident to me that Trump doesn't know how to respond to Bernie Sanders because any appeal that Trump has it's undercut by Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders is the true anti-establishment, real populist candidate. So what is Trump going to say about Bernie Sanders? I mean, calling him crazy Bernie, that's not going to land. Like, Crooked Hillary landed because there was truth to that, right? Now, it was hypocritical because Donald Trump is also very crooked. But nonetheless, crazy Bernie doesn't really mean anything when Donald Trump is the one making that argument when he struggles to string together a coherent sentence. So it's not going to land. And I don't think he knows how to deal with Bernie Sanders. Nonetheless, like it or not, 
He may have to. So he's afraid, and as a result, he has sent out emails about Bernie Sanders two days in a row attacking him. And I love this because it offers us a glimpse into the types of attacks that we might see during the general if we actually do get a Trump versus Bernie situation. And uh, I'll just say this. I feel a lot more confident about Bernie's chances after seeing what Trump is using to attack him on. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's really, really bad. Um, so in the first email he sent out, it reads, Dangerous. Bernie Sanders can't be trusted to defend American lives. Sanders opposed taking top terrorist Soleimani off the battlefield while repeating Iranian and Russian propaganda. So this is a horrible strategy for a number of reasons. First of all, he's literally invoking anti-Russian hysteria to attack Bernie Sanders. Now, on top of that, um, he's citing something that he did, which only has a plurality of support from Americans, 43 to 47%, I believe, approve of the killing of Soleimani, which is way too high, mind you. But Bernie Sanders can easily take him on here because he can show videos of Donald Trump saying he was anti-interventionist in 2016 and contrast that with what he's doing now. Like, if you truly want to go about this by being the stronger candidate, the defense candidate, when you won because you got a lot of people to believe that you were less hawkish than Hillary Clinton, like, Bernie's going to mop the floor with you. But that's not the only attack. So for the second email, he says, Fact, Bernie Sanders is a wealthy, fossil fuel-guzzling millionaire. Just like the wealthy Hollywood elite, Bernie Sanders lectures Americans how to live their lives while doing the exact opposite. So let me put this into perspective for you. Donald Trump, a billionaire, is attacking Bernie Sanders for being a millionaire and is claiming that he's elitist. Like, I don't think this is going to play as well as Trump believes it will in a general election. If you put, you know, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders up side by side. I mean, that juxtaposition, and you had to ask people, who do you believe is truly, you know, anti-elitist? Nine times out of 10, they're going to say it's Bernie Sanders. Um, so this is not going to land, but I want to go a little bit further into this email and just read like a paragraph to see the route that he's taking when it comes to his Bernie is an elitist argument. Quote, Bernie Sanders is lecturing the American people that they need to pay more in taxes, surrender their private health insurance plans, and accept job losses in order to implement his extreme left-wing agenda. But he's just another Hollywood-style hypocrite who demands working-class Americans make sacrifices. And we'll stop there because, I mean, this is just, it's, <laughs> it's laughable. So, I mean, when it comes to Bernie Sanders facilitating job losses, he's supporting a policy that is literally titled Federal Jobs Guarantee. Federal Jobs Guarantee. You're not going to be able to easily argue against that. And Donald Trump is effectively taking a pro-private insurance stance here. Like, Trump doesn't realize that if he wants to win then he has to come up with an argument that appeals to independents and young Republican voters, young voters who aren't voting, because there's going to be a lot of young people that come out to vote for Bernie Sanders. And if that truly is the case, if he can galvanize the youth, it's over for Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, he needs to work on some type of argument that actually appeals to young voters. And arguing in defense of the status quo is not going to do the trick. These are policies like a federal jobs guarantee, uh, Medicare for all, that appeal to young people. So Trump doesn't know what to do against Bernie Sanders. And we can see that what he's trying to do is still appeal to populist individuals, claim that he is anti-establishment, but he doesn't realize that he's making a critical mistake. And he reveals how out of touch he is when you look at his new catchphrase, keep America great. Now, if he kept the Make America Great Again slogan, I think that that would have been fine. You could have argued, look, America is getting greater, but we're not fully there yet. We have more work to do. I need, I need another four years. But he's saying keep America great. This is painfully out of touch. And this is literally the Democrat slogan back in 2016. Does anyone remember Debbie Wasserman Schultz wearing hats that said America is already great? I mean, do you understand what you're communicating to voters here? It assumes that all of their problems 
have been solved. And, you know, make America great again, it simply meant that Americans needed to elect you, and you are the greatness. But the reason why that slogan worked so well for Trump in 2016 was because it was a blank slate. Like, people could attribute meaning to it and think through what they believed would make America great again. But with Keep America Great, you're just telling them that it's already great, and in a sense, you're erasing all of the issues that normal working Americans face. And the reason why Donald Trump won over voters in the Rust Belt was because he was speaking to the issues that impact them. But if you're telling Americans that America is already great when most of the country is living paycheck to paycheck, I mean, you're literally making the same mistake that Democrats made back in 2016. So this is great. I'm not complaining. Keep it up. Use this strategy, Trump, because um, I want you to make this case in a general against Bernie because it's not going to work very well for you. Now, Bernie responded saying, Donald Trump is attacking us because he knows we will beat him in the general election. Absolutely. Um, this attack is really, really bad. Like, I honestly expected Donald Trump to come up with something better. Like, I wasn't expecting him to, you know, have some type of compelling case against Bernie Sanders, but I actually had higher expectations than this, at least. So, I mean, at this rate, if he releases another email by tomorrow, he will call Bernie Sanders a communist. And really, he's just flailing at this point. Nothing he can say about Bernie will convince Americans that he's the true anti-establishment candidate. Everyone knows it's Bernie Sanders. So um, this is great. Like in the events, Bernie Sanders is the nominee and he's going up against Donald Trump. My confidence after seeing a preview of the attacks that Trump would use against him, it just increased. Like, it's not a foregone conclusion. We still have to work towards that goal of winning the presidency. But seeing what Trump comes up with here, I feel a lot more confident now. Uh, this is not a good attack. It's not going to land. Trump is, uh, yeah, <laughs> he's not going to do too well against Bernie Sanders. Uh, this tells you everything you need to know. If you want to win, vote for Bernie because Trump does not know how to attack him. But the Democrats are taking their cues from socialist Bernie Sanders and that group. Omar, AOC, Talib, isn't she a nice woman? Talib. Talib. Why? What a group. But they're the leaders of the party. They're really, in my opinion, the leaders. That's what happened. That's how they got into this impeachment hoax. The leaders of the party are this AOC, uh, Talib, and Omar. And Pelosi meets them and she shakes and quivers and she's very scared. Ha! Got him! This week, Bernie Sanders received two huge endorsements from really important grassroots organizations that are comprised largely of young people, young activists specifically. The Sunrise Movement and Dream Defenders. Now first, we'll talk about the Sunrise Movement. So they held a democratic vote. They allowed their members to decide who to endorse. And Bernie Sanders won by a landslide. Wasn't even close. So as the New York Times reports, in a landslide vote, more than 75% of respondents, Mr. Sanders earned the backing of members of the group, which has quickly become politically influential since its founding in 2017. Once a fledgling collection of college students frustrated that Democrats and Republicans were not acting more quickly to curb climate change, Sunrise has grown to 318 chapters nationwide with more than 10,000 members. Sunrise will host an event on January 12th with Mr. Sanders in Iowa City to formally announce the endorsement. We believe a Bernie Sanders presidency would provide the best political terrain in which to engage in and ultimately win that struggle for the world we deserve, Varshini Prakash, a founder and the executive director of the movement, said in a statement. Senator Sanders has made it clear throughout his political career and in his campaign that he grasps the scale of the climate crisis, the urgency with which we must act to address it, and the opportunity we have in coming together to do so. Now, this is a huge deal because the Sunrise Movement has members who are politically engaged and most importantly, politically active. So they can get out the vote for Bernie Sanders campaign for him and canvas for him in states like Iowa and New Hampshire. This is incredibly important. This is huge. It adds to his already huge and monumental movement. So this is a really, really big deal. Like, I don't want people to take this for granted. This is 
huge. Now, some people are complaining that the Sunrise Movement endorsed him, you know, later than they should have, but this is an early organization, like, this is, it's baby years, right? So, they're still ironing out some of the details of how they're going to function as an organization, and, you know, either way, I'm really happy that they chose to endorse him. Now, without further ado, this is their endorsement. I absolutely loved this. Hi, my name is Marshani Prakash. I am one of the co-founders of and currently serving as the executive director for Sunrise Movement. We're endorsing Bernie Sanders for president because he has proven again and again and again that he understands this issue. He understands its scope. He understands the severity. He understands that it is a social justice issue, that it's about racial and economic justice, that it's about the fight of our lives. And he understands that this isn't just about a conversation happening in Washington. This is about changing the lives of millions of working people across this country for the better. Whether it's farmers in Iowa, whether it's people living in Cancer Alley in Louisiana, whether it is people fleeing from sea level rise in Miami, Bernie Sanders understands that this is a crisis and it's time to act now. Sunrise is a movement that is made up of teenagers and 20-somethings who have watched our entire lives as the political establishment kicks the can down the road and fails to deliver on this issue. And we are saying enough is enough. Bernie Sanders has been saying the exact same things for his entire political career. He has made it clear that in Washington, he will hold on to his convictions, to his political courage, to his morals, to his values in a place where people are far more likely to bend to the will of moneyed interests. So we really trust Bernie Sanders in a way that we haven't been able to trust many other politicians. And we believe that if Bernie Sanders becomes president of the United States of America, his first and foremost priority will be to the people of the United States of America. Over the last year, when Young People with Sunrise Movement and millions of other young people pushed on our politicians to act, Bernie Sanders responded to the call immediately by fully embracing the Green New Deal, embracing a $16 trillion plan to get America's economy back on its feet, to employ people all across the country in jobs that will save our future and our planet. And I think that one of the biggest reasons why young people are so excited to endorse Bernie Sanders right now is because he supports a Green New Deal. We demand a Green New Deal! We demand a Green New Deal! We demand a Bernie Sanders is one critical part of the equation, but he won't be everything. When Bernie Sanders says he'll be the organizer in chief, what I hear is that he's saying that it isn't just about him, that we can't enact a political revolution in this country just because of one man or one moment. This has to be the sustained effort of millions of people, of many movements coming together and changing the political tide in this country. I believe that Bernie Sanders as president of the United States will work hand in hand with movements across this country and people everywhere to manifest the America of our dreams. That was excellent. Now, remember, this is an organization that is made up mostly of young people who are going to be key to the Democratic Party's success in 2020. So this endorsement, along with the endorsement of the Dream Defenders, is another wake-up call to the establishment. If you want to win, you've got to galvanize and excite young voters. You need them to get out and vote. And this is another indication that it's Bernie Sanders who will be the candidate to do that. Now, moving on from uh, Sunrise, the Dream Defenders is another organization that endorsed Bernie Sanders. Now, this is a group based out of Miami, Florida. They predominantly focus on criminal justice, but they also focus on issues like freedom and liberation more broadly. So they advocate on behalf of Palestinian human rights, and they put out a really strong endorsement of Bernie Sanders, also emphasizing the movement aspect of his campaign. Take a look. We're not special or extraordinary. We're everyday kids who got tired of doing nothing and witnessing our people murder. A young boy was killed in a gated community in Sanford, Florida, and it made us stand up, even if we never stood up before. 
We rose in the tender rage of a grieving mother and father. We demanded justice loudly. We are an uprising of young people from all across the state of Florida in struggle together. And we are fighting for a world where every person and child is treated with dignity and respect. A world where people are valued more than profit. We are the dream defenders. We are descendants of the hard working hands that built this country. We created better lives out of nothing, for us and by us. We have inherited the freedom to be and to exist. In 2020, we are not electing a candidate. We are choosing a movement. We endorse affordable housing, livable wages, free education, a comprehensive universal healthcare system. We endorse justice that heals, not a system that locks our people up and throws away the key. We endorse clean drinking water and breathable air. We endorse a country without walls where children are free from cages. We endorse a free, flourishing democracy and the right to vote. We endorse us and the movement to elect Bernie Sanders for President of the United States of America. Join us as we continue to mobilize and organize our communities across race, gender, age, and class for the world we know is possible and for the power we know is with the people. If our liberation began with the vision of a world without the colony, slum, favela, and ghetto, then this is the year. So that was also great. I like that they're kind of communicating to everyone that Bernie Sanders isn't a candidate. He is a movement. We're a movement. And all of these mini movements are coalescing around Bernie Sanders into one gigantic national movement. I mean, Bernie Sanders himself, starting with his 2016 campaign, built up a movement that turned into this gigantic, you know, um, national awakening, if you want to say, where we have justice Democrats now, brand new Congress, our revolution, the Sunrise Movement, Dream Defenders. And even if they didn't necessarily start out with Bernie Sanders campaign or, you know, emerge because of his campaign, all of these movements are coming together with the realization that it's grassroots organizing and mobilization, which is going to be the key to our success. And if we all kind of come together and bind together, we can actually win this thing. So young people, young people, you know, who comprise a lot of organizations such as Sunrise, uh, the DSA, they are coming out and they're saying Bernie is the candidate that we want. If the Democratic Party doesn't pay attention to what's happening and pay attention to how many young people are coalescing around Bernie's movement, then that tells me that they're not serious about winning and defeating Donald Trump. Because again, the way that you win your ticket to victory is to have a high turnout. And if they turn out or not, millennials, young people will determine the outcome of this election. So we win if young people turn out. We need a candidate who will excite them. It's Bernie Sanders, and this is just another sign, aside from all of the polls, that shows he is the candidate of young people because he is representing us. He's listening to us, and he's responding to what we need with policy solutions. Hello, everyone. I am here with Dr. Harvey J. K. He is a professor of democracy and justice at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay. And he is also the author of a fantastic book called Take Hold of Our History, Make America Radical Again. And he's here to talk about it. I just finished the book on Monday and it's phenomenal. So, Professor, thank you so much for coming on the program. No, th thank you for having me on. This, this is great. It's a great opportunity. And, and also, I've been really eager to, to meet you because I've watched some of your stuff and I, I like your spirit. Oh, thank you so much. That means so much. You know, I, I found out about you from the Michael Brooks show. Shout out to Michael Brooks. He always brings on these fantastic guests. And that's where I saw your book and I bought the book. And it was so great because it kind of reaffirms everything that I've been thinking, because there's this conversation in mainstream media currently about whether or not people in the Democratic Party, namely AOC, Rashida Tlaib, are going too far left. And basically what you demonstrate in this book is that 
people who say that social democrats are too far left, they're kind of ahistorical because we have a history of being radical. FTR called on a generation to be radical or on people to be radical for a generation. So can you talk about our history as basically radicals? Because I think that people here in mainstream media that you can't be too far left in America because we are a conservative country. And sure, people identify as conservative, but political labels don't necessarily mean that much. Because when you look at the policies, we are very progressive. And now when you look at our history, there's no question. We're a radical nation. So can you talk through our history and how we are actually radical? And I know that that's a really huge you know, topic, but can you give us the rundown? Well, OK, so th the high points. How's that? There so you go. The high points begin with my childhood hero, Thomas Paine, and in his pamphlet, Common Sense, which was a pamphlet in which he put into words what Americans were already thinking in the course of their rebellion of 19, I'm sorry, of 1774 and 1775. But they hadn't themselves gotten to the point of seeing the possibility of not only declaring their independence and creating this new radical nation, but also of creating a democratic republic. And it was Paine who basically brought, brought forth their sentiments and their ideas that they had yet to articulate. And Paine says something in that in that pamphlet, Common Sense of January 76, which I think it's in one sense, it seems so utopian. And in another sense, it's so absolutely true. He says we have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, it's utopian because, of course, we can't just, you know, stop history and start all over again. But it's but it's true in the sense of what he's saying is history is made by human action. And therefore, we have a possibility of truly radically transforming our relationship to the world. And he was trying to get Americans to realize that they were, in fact, Americans, not Britons. They should, that, and thus, they should not think of themselves as British subjects and what might they accomplish in those terms, but think of themselves as American citizens. And he also asked them to consider, it's like the, the, what they used to say during the late 60s, the whole world is watching. The, humanity was waiting for that kind of revolutionary moment that Americans themselves were able to, to, to create and provide for all, of, for all of the Americans' faults and failings at the time. And all of that comes to be in some ways expressed in the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, you know, unalienable rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, those words, now to, to move ahead in radical terms and social democratic terms, those words actually did provide the basis for in every generation, both Paine's words and you know Jefferson's own, you might say, provided so that in every generation of, of American history, the most progressive elements, whether they were liberals or progressives or radicals or indeed eventually socialists, when they reached back to lay claim to the American Revolution, they laid hold of common sense and the Declaration to say, look, we are what America is about. America is a grand experiment in democracy. And basically, look, let's face it, any experiment requires constant testing and pushing at the limits. So, you know, whether they were free thinkers or abolitionists or women's rights activists, also known as suffragists eventually, or whether they were labor unionists, uh, populists of the late 19th century, progressives with a capital P, socialists, anarchists, in every one of those generations, they reach all the way through to the civil rights movement and even to today, this kind of they, this reaching back took place and this reminding of themselves of what America is meant to be. Again, we have a history of exploitation and oppression and, and enough tragedy and irony that we could go on forever on that subject. But it's also the case that through the course of those confrontations and those struggles and those aspirations that created movements, we actually did create a far freer, more equal, and more democratic America. And then if I could take it in another direction, which people often find surprising, is that if we actually think about social democracy itself, it's rooted in the same pen, and I say pen, that actually sparks the, or turns the American rebellion into a revolution. Because 20 years later, in the 1790s, Thomas Paine writes Rights of Man, in the midst of the French Revolution, and then he writes a pamphlet called Agrarian Justice, which is which is the pamphlet that first envisioned social democracy. In this pamphlet, he called for taxing the landed rich in order to provide stakes, S-T-A-K-E-S, to young people so that you could combat poverty. 
Okay, at the that when they reach maturity, they should be given a certain amount of money in order to go out and make something of themselves in the world and prevent poverty from becoming the norm of their lives. But it also included this very radical idea, which later co we come to call social security. He actually said there should be universal old age pensions for, for, for men and women when they reach a certain age of, you know, we'll call the L, an, a, a seniority age. So, so here is Thomas Paine, the American revolutionary and, and radical founder, who's also 20 years later seeing the consequences in Europe, especially of what we would call capitalism, he would call civilization. And he said, it's imperative that we recognize that the earth was created for all of us and property has been monopolized by a lot of people. He didn't call for dispossessing the property, but he said, they owe all of us a tax to provide for the makings of what we think of as social democracy. And then if you, if you move through history, and I could go on and on, but let's go right to one of the greatest names in American history, Abraham Lincoln. Even as Lincoln led the Union in the Civil War to sustain the Union, and, in, and truly when he signed the Emancipation Proclamation in response to all of those Southern slaves seeking uh, freedom in the North and seeking a role in the, in the Civil War against slavery, Lincoln also signed two other very significant bills, one of which is the Homestead Act, which was the transformation of the Midwest and the Plain States into family farming, okay, affording federal, federal lands to family farms. That's social democracy at its best in many ways, enabling people to make, to make their way, with, uh, to secure a wherewithal for themselves. But then he also signed another social democratic bill, the Marill Act, which was the Land Grant Act, which provided federal lands to states to create state colleges and universities. So that now in every state of the union, there are state universities and state university systems which are rooted in the 1862 Marill Act that Lincoln signed. So here we have the, the, the greatest president of the 19th century, some people the greatest president ever, who is known, of course, as the great emancipator, though he himself fully appreciated that there was no way that he could sign the, the Emancipation Proclamation had it not been for slaves rising up in the South and Northern farmers and workers in the Union Army realizing the imperative of ending slavery. Here he is advancing the, the idea of equality to include social democracy. And then, of course, the great social democratic president, though he never used the term, is Franklin Roosevelt. And, you know, it's the New Deal, it's the, it's the creation of Social Security, it's the en en enactment of the National Labor Relations Act. I mean, over and over again, our greatest moments in American history are moments of radicalism and social democratic advance. And I love the way that you talk about that in the book, because the way that you frame it is there's there's no end point to democracy. This is an ongoing project where we're constantly trying to push the envelope and radicalism is in our DNA as Americans. So to suggest, you know, as, as we often see in the mainstream media, that actually, you know, we're, we're more conservative ideologically. We're not radical. We can't be too far left. That is ahistorical. And I, I love the way that you lay this out. Now, one narrative that I think is really interesting, just in general with regard to American politics, is there, there's always like, a conservative will say something, right? And then all of a sudden you see a hundred conservatives parroting that same thing in mainstream media and that narrative catches on and it has led to the left essentially losing any type of battle, political battle, ideological battle in a way because they're so good at, you know, re retaking back whatever narrative or reframing a narrative. And I think it's because you kind of diagnosed this problem. And I want to see if I could find that line. Um, so this is what you say. Democratic presidents Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama offer no real challenge to the right wing storytelling. They are so good at storytelling. They are able to take whatever we're talking about and flip it and have that catch on. I mean, one example that stands out to me is when we were discussing the Affordable Care Act, which was right-wing health care reform. It was milk toast. It was cooked up by the Heritage Foundation. We were talking about death panels all of a sudden, and the mainstream media had to, you know, assume that that was an idea that was credible or at least, you know, respond to it. So can you talk a little bit about storytelling and why that's so important? Because I kind of see you doing storytelling in the sense that you're telling us about our actual history and not allowing them to capture that narrative and not let go of it. Yeah, well, there's a moment I can, there's a, a moment, I think, that's really very telling in those terms. And it's in the late 
1970s when Ronald Reagan, well, in 76, he lost the Republican nomination to Gerald Ford. And I think a lot of people figured Reagan was out of the picture. But he makes a comeback. A comeback, And he was far smarter than most people on the left appreciated. And literally the connections he was making in the course of the 60s and 70s as the leader of, the, of what we come to know as the new right enabled him to win the nomination from the Republicans in 1980. But here's the key thing. So winning the Republican nomination was by no means a guarantee he would have won the presidency, though the chances were good given the fact that Jimmy Carter was such an abysmal president and most Americans were utterly working people, utterly fed up with his presidency. But here's the thing. He knew from his own early days as a liberal Democrat, an FDR and a Truman Democrat, that most working people were not going to respond to the kinds of things that he was known for having promoted back in the 60s into the 70s, like an attack on Social Security, you know, or, or for that matter, ending farm subsidies. I mean, you, the panoply, the whole thing that FDR had put into place in the New Deal. So he completely shifts his ground in many ways and drops the sort of attacks on on um, on the New Deal legacy. He continues to sort of campaign against liberalism, undeniably. But in his acceptance speech, which is, of course, going to be watched by the vast majority of Americans back in those days, conventions mattered even more than they do today. And people watched them to see what the political uh, atmosphere of the day would become. And he stands before the Republican convention and shocks the hell out of conservatives, even as he's literally becoming their not just champion, but their their standard holder, their, you know, their flag bearer. He quotes in the course of his acceptance speech three figures left should have had an option. Thomas Paine, Abraham Lincoln, and Franklin Roosevelt. He's so shocked conservatives that George Will, I believe, wrote a column almost immediately after the convention lamenting the fact that, that Reagan had quoted Thomas Paine, the, the, the revolutionary, as opposed to Burke, Edmund Burke, the conservative. Yeah, so they're really good conservatives in terms of, first of all, asking questions about American history, and then suppressing the story that, that most Americans carry with them, but appropriating, ripping off, hijacking figures and events from the past and inserting them into an utterly alien narrative that they would, I mean, who could have imagined Thomas Paine ever being quoted by a conservative? For 200 years, conservatives did everything to suppress Thomas Paine's memory. Who could have imagined the Republicans any time after, say, 1932, really wanting to embrace Lincoln. Because here's Lincoln, you know, the man who brings an end to slavery, who, who becomes the social democrat. Well, here's the thing. What, has hap what happens is that in the course of the 70s, the Democrats retreated. They retreated from the Roosevelt story and legacy. Uh, figures like uh, Gary Hart. I don't know if everyone will remember Gary Hart, but Gary Hart the uh, senator from Oregon, well, becomes senator from Oregon, and Jimmy Carter. These kind of figures, they turn their backs on not just the FDR legacy and the FDR tradition, they turn their backs on American working people. Seriously turn their backs on American working people. Moreover, there was this, they sought out the money power, as the populace might have called them, the money power. That is, they were, they wanted to fill their coffers with the money of the rich and the corporate uh, uh, entities instead of thinking about mobilizing Americans. And in it felt no need to speak of the American story, the American story that would have been Thomas Paine, Lincoln, Franklin Roosevelt, but rather they sort of retreated. And what happens is, whether it was liberals inside the Democratic Party or leftists outside of it, if you look over and over again, the story that they're responding to of the conservatives leads them in a knee-jerk way to reject the American story. In other words, the left literally turned its back on its own story and its own powerful claim to America, to the United States. Now, we should never turn our back and forever forget the stories of exploitation and oppression. I mean, I mean, the struggles emerge out of those experiences. But it's also the case, if we're not going to remember the, if the, the American promise of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which Lincoln readily used to advance his cause, which FDR readily used. If we're going to forget those things, then we're basically handing over American history full time 
to the conservatives. Now, it, it's all the more imperative that we not continue to do that because Americans themselves yearn for that story. They, they, they feel it in the, you called it the American DNA. We feel it in a deep cultural memory-like way. And the fact is the Democrats and the left failed to articulate the story that Americans were yearning to hear and that conservatives appropriated or hijacked and ultimately corrupted in terrible ways. And in fact, one of the beauties to go, you know, you mentioned, um, I can't remember if it was during our conversation beforehand, you know, the, the, the squad, you know, AOC and, and her comrades. One of the things that really struck me is very early on after she won election to, uh, the, to Congress, AOC was interviewed, I think it was the, on TV by one of the, you know, the, the sort of mainstream media types. And she actually laid claim to the American story, you know, of Abraham Lincoln and Franklin Roosevelt. And, but the surprising thing was that there were people on the left who said, what is she doing? You know, why is she doing that? And I thought, are they kidding? I mean, she's out ahead of a whole couple of generations of left intellectuals by laying claim to that. And Bernie Sanders, even more than he had done in 2015, which he did smartly on one occasion, but then failed to continue. This time around, he is laying claim to that Roosevelt legacy. So, I mean, I think there's reason to be hopeful. But here's the thing. It isn't only that we do that in order to win an election. I mean, there's no guarantees of winning elections. But we need to cultivate the narrative that conservatives for 45 years have over and over again tried to you know, pervert and corrupt and tell it as a sort of God, God-given divine story, America, as opposed to a story of struggles from the bottom up. And so, so in essence, what we need to do is we have to break through the kind of nostalgia renditions of American history and remind Americans of who they are, and they want to be reminded. That's the thing. I mean, I, there are surveys and polls that show that. Two good examples. The whole phenomenon that was called founders chic or founders fever back in the 70s, when all of a sudden everybody was talking about the founding fathers, okay? Similarly, the greatest generation phenomena. Everybody was celebrating the World War II generation. The conservatives immediately glommed on to those two things as if those are conservative stories. And everyone thought because the vast majority of Americans seemed interested in hearing those stories that they were doing so because they were somehow fooled by the conservatives or that they themselves were conservative. What the left, and, and by the way, the left scorned a lot of that talk. And what they utterly failed to do is to lay claim to Thomas Paine or reclaim Thomas Paine, or for that matter, to realize the greatest generation is the generation that actually made the New Deal happen, the generation that pushed FDR to go even further towards social democracy than he himself might have gone. So it, it, it was astounding to me and frustrating as hell that when I would speak sometimes of these things, people on the left would get angry with me. You know, like I was like I was some kind of nationalist, a patriot. Yes, a nationalist. That's another story. OK, and I think we we need to reclaim the American story, not simply for the sake of remembering them, but for the sake of remembering who we are. Yeah. And that that reminds me of what you talked about, basically us taking back that narrative of American exceptionalism, because now it has very negative connotations. If you're a lefty, you know, we think about um, I think about U.S. imperialism, U.S. supremacy. But really, that wasn't necessarily always the case. It was another narrative and story, if you will, that conservatives had reclaimed. So you, you talked about, you know, 45 years of the Republican Party doing deregulation, austerity. Um, you know, shifting the tax burden from the working class um, or away from elites to the working class. And now I think that there is reason to be optimistic when we know about the history and basically know what to look for. Like you mentioned, Occupy popping up, you know, the, the success of Bernie in 2015 and now, you know, 2019. And even though necessarily electoral politics in and of itself might not be what catalyzes the shift, you know, to greater democratization. Um, you know, it, it always comes from the bottom up. And I think that that this book is a reminder that real change does come from the bottom up when we are reminded that we have always pushed further. You know, we've always pushed the envelope and real change never comes from the top down. It's always the bottom up. Now, one portion of this book, and we talked about this before going on, um, that really stood out to me that I loved because it irritated me 
was uh, back in 2015, <laughs> we were talking about social democracy finally, and Claire McCaskill was interviewed on MSNBC, and she kind of scoffed at this idea of Bernie Sanders being the nominee, and she said, oh, he's too liberal. Now, I love a line, like your response to this basically was, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, um, well, we know that Republicans lost their mind, so now we, we have to worry about Democrats losing their mind too. And you made a point that social democracy is... American. This is not a foreign concept. We're not talking about European democracy. We're talking about American, uh, an American concept. Social democracy is American. Can you kind of speak a little bit to that? Because I think it's something that's really fascinating. And I, I think that even myself, like I, I think I do a disservice because when I talk about social democracy, I use Scandinavia as an example. I always point there. I point elsewhere as basically, you know, legitimizing my argument using empirical data. But we don't even have to do that because social democracy is American. Can you speak to that? Well, as I said before, so Thomas Paine is the godfather of social security and social democracy, okay? This American revolutionary, that's first of all. Abraham Lincoln is in many ways the first of the sort of proto, call it social democratic or proto-social democratic presidents. Franklin Roosevelt, the New Deal, the, or the, the, the empowerment of labor. But here's the other thing. Let, let's go to something very, very basically American which has been under siege these last 45 years, especially under siege from the right, public education. The first nation to truly create public education as a right for young people, okay? It's not in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, but it is in state constitutions. And we accept it as a fundamental right, the right to be educated. Well, public education is the great social democratic beginning where you're saying we're all in this together, we need an educated citizenry, a concept that goes back to even the elite of the founding fathers who, who believe that in order to sustain a republic, you needed an, ed an educated, informed citizenry. So we, we pioneer public education, right? Even the, uh, and then if, if you think about it, think about it this way, when the whole idea of a national park system, not a royal park system, as in European uh, nations, but national parks. National parks were this late 19th century American development. They have actually originate as a concept in the Lincoln, Lincoln president, expand in the progressive era, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, but even beyond that, Franklin Roosevelt's attention to all of that. But the national park system is this great social democratic idea that we can all have access for recreation and refreshment of ourselves and that we don't have to pay for it, okay? I mean, that's social democracy. Similarly, you know, social security and so on. Two, two things I want to point out in those terms. One, I'll jump ahead. Michael Moore did a film a few years ago, uh, Where to Invade Next, something like that. Does that, you, you remember that film? It, yeah, it, and, it, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. <laughs> no, it's like, you know, it's the idea is he goes to Europe and he checks out all of their social democratic innovations. But w the point of the film wasn't Scandinavia or the continent of Europe, the point was that these were all American innovations that the Europeans adopted and that somehow we've forgotten or we failed to advance because we've been under siege in a, this class war from above that Republicans have championed these last 40, 45 years. So, okay, so here's the, here's, another, here's the other thought. So Bernie Sanders, as I said before, in 2015, he, he actually gave a speech at Georgetown University to explain democratic socialism, which is just another term for social democracy, basically. And, and, I, and in that speech, he, what he does is he recalls Franklin Roosevelt's idea of the Economic Bill of Rights. Uh, Roosevelt himself in 32 proposed an Economic Declaration of Rights. In 1941, he actually called for Americans to envision and pursue Four Freedoms. I did a book on the fight for the Four Freedoms. Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. And then in 1944, in a State of the Union message, FDR calls for the creation and enactment of an economic bill of rights, which is, believe me, a, the radical presentation of social democracy. So it never comes to fruition as he envisioned, but it is it is developed in terms of what was called the GI Bill of Rights, that in, and in which a whole generation of veterans, 12 million of them, literally make something of themselves with the educational and other kinds of opportunities that the GI Bill of Rights afforded, and they remake the nation, they rebuild the nation. 
And everybody today with any kind of historical sensibility knows of the GI Bill of Rights. But what we, what we failed to do and what the Democrats have failed to do is to say, we have this story of this great, these great social democratic innovations. So what I would imagine is, as Bernie has begun to do more effectively, is that the Democrats, if you're not a social democrat, you can't be a Democrat. Claire McCaskill had the audacity to say that, well, in 2015, we have these extremists, Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. And I thought to myself, how dare she? How dare she? She was she, it's like she was a Republican, not a Democrat. Right. How dare she utterly reject the greatest moments of the Democrats, capital D and small d Democratic story, the struggles of the New Deal years, which were both top down and bottom up. The, the advancements that even took place during World War II, and then think about the 1960s. I mean, for all, you know, he was a Southern Democrat, LBJ, but he was an old FDR Democrat. And Medicare, Medicaid, um, the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Acts, of course, the Environmental Protection uh, Agency, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, consumer rights, all of these developments of the 60s, which were if you like, the, the advancement of the social democratic ideal that FDR had truly put on the agenda. And this pseudo-democrat, Claire McCaskill, says, Bernie's an extremist. And that's when I said, yeah, the Democrats must be losing their minds. They clearly lost their memories, their amnesiacs. But our p task must be to make sure, not just that we, you know, talk about social democracy, but that we remind Americans that social democracy, as you said, or as, the, I, as Bill Moyers, who really was the source of the idea for my writing that said, social democracy is 100% American. Bill and I were supposed to co-author that piece, but something came up and I ended up doing it. And he wouldn't put his name on it because he said, you wrote it, you take the credit. And I can tell you that piece is probably the most liked piece I've ever written in the sense on Twitter and on Facebook. It, the response was tremendous. So I was convinced Americans wanted to hear the truth of history, not the kind of crap that the Republicans were spewing, and surely not the kind of crap that Claire McCaskill was spewing. <laughs> yeah, I love that you brought that up in the book, because that clip, there was something about it, like the way that she said it, too. It just it irked me and it really stuck, you know, it stuck by me. Um, and it's been on my mind. And when I read that in the book, I just thought, oh, this is this is so good. So the book itself, to me, like this is a reminder that we are on the right path. And I don't know that we're going to get there in this generation, but we certainly are doing the right thing. And I think that there's this you can correct me if um, if I'm wrong. I think that there's this instinct on the left for us to kind of self censor because Republicans are so good at storytelling and capturing that narrative. You know, we don't want to go too far left because that could turn off voters. But in actuality, we're just basically returning to our roots. And I think that that is incredibly important. So my pitch for the book is everyone who is a believer in, you know, uh, Bernie's presidency um, and campaign and social democracy has got to read this because it, it basically it tells you that you're on the right track. But before we go, I want to allow you to make your pitch for the book. It's fun. It's phenomenal. We'll have links on screen and down below for people to order it. Uh, but tell us what you think that we haven't discussed. People need to know about the book. Well, OK, I, I want to give credit to the people who've inspired me to think in those terms. OK, so we need to remember that we're the like the children of Thomas Paine, the revolutionary. OK, we carry it with us. He made us radicals then and we're, we're radicals to this day. And I wrote an earlier book, Thomas Paine and the Promise of America. But this book. OK, so that was one. Then I wrote this book titled The Fight for the Four Freedoms about FDR and the Greatest Generation. And those books are highly political as much as they're historical. But this book, if I can then hold it up again myself, this take hold of our history, make America radical again. This this book is says that this it's not just a matter of making sense of why we feel the way we do, why we why it is that we saw these movements emerge like the fight for 15 Black Lives Matter, the 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 um, eventually the march, the, the women's march, uh, the Moral Monday movement, the teachers strikes. I mean, those are remar all of these things indicate that we are we yearn to in Langston Hughes, great poetic uh, terms. We want to make America, America, the America that has never been. But that's the story of progressivism and radicalism and democratic socialism, that we are seeking to make America 
the America that is that is part of our promise, but as yet has never been. Now, I just I'd like to. There's a quote that I love using. I probably use it in all my writing. Uh, it was Henry Demers Lloyd, a, a journalist of around 1900, who was a depending on who claims him, either a populist or a progressive or a socialist, doesn't matter. He said basically, and he drew on Wendell Phillips, the 19th century radical, when he said this. He said, you know. Liberty requires more than perpetual vigilance. If we're going to sustain liberty or democracy and freedom and equality, we not only have to defend and protect the rights that our parents gave us, we need to create new rights for our children. And that's the point. There's a radical imperative in American life. We feel it. We don't always act upon it. But what that imperative is trying to tell us is, if you believe in democracy, then you don't simply defend democracy. To sustain democracy, you have to extend and deepen it. I can't make that point strongly enough. And the best evidence of that is that when Americans have been in the face of mortal crises, the 1770s, the 1860s, the 1930s, the 1940s, maybe even the 1960s in the Cold War, what we've found is that the only way whether we liked it or not, in fact, the only way to confront and transcend the crisis and our enemies, whether they were foreign or domestic, was to make America radical, democratic public, end slavery, empower working people, and, and you know, civil rights and voting rights, and, and, and enabling people to transcend the poverty of their lives. That's what America is meant to be, and that's that's the struggle ahead of us. So I'll go back to something you said. It's not a matter of going too far left. It's how American do we want to be? I love that, and um, we can't possibly end stronger than that. It's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Professor K. Once again, the book is Take Hold of Our History, Make America Radical. Again, there will be links in the description box if you'd like to read it yourself. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Hello everyone, I'm here with Amanda CB running to represent Oregon's first congressional district and she is here to talk about her campaign. Amanda, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. This is amazing. I really appreciate it. I'm so excited to have you because unlike all the other candidates, you're unique in the sense that I can vote for you. You're in my district um, and I'm incredibly enthusiastic about your campaign um, and of course unequivocally I endorse you, um, where basically this is the only, I think, race where it makes sense for me to endorse. I already tacitly endorse pretty much everyone who I talk to, but I feel like in this district it matters because I can vote for you and anyone who I know will know who Amanda CB is. Um, so tell us why you decided to run for Congress. Of course, you're running against Suzanne Bonamici. She's not the worst Democrat, I would say, but I, I feel like she hasn't been adequately representing us. But I kind of want to know what made you decide to run? Well, she's definitely not the worst Democrat, but she's definitely not the best either. And that's part of the problem is that we settle for mediocre candidates so often because we don't have any other option. Um, what really got me to run, I really, I grew up wanting to run for office, but I never saw it as a possibility. You know, I was raised in a family where women weren't supposed to run for office. We were supposed to be the politician's wife. Um, so when Hillary Clinton ran, for the Senate in New York, it was like a big time for me. And I was so excited, but it turned into, well, she can run because she has the name and she has the money. But when Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez ran and won, it opened up that entire possibility. I chose to run against Bonamici because she has been systematically bad when it comes to disability rights. Um, Disability rights are something that's very, very big for me. I am an injured worker. I became disabled after a f on the job fall. Um, my employers didn't give me the sufficient time off to recover and my modified duty turned into, okay, abandon your crutches and do your regular work. And it led to a full body nerve disorder and I lost everything. And so when we don't have anybody in Congress that really understands that and is willing to to represent that and fight back, then it's time for new people to run and who will fight for those things and who will represent those stories because there's so many more 
out there than we we see and we understand. Every story in this country matters and everyone is important and we forget that. You know, I mean, one in five voters is disabled across the country, one in four here in Oregon. And yet the only time we talk about disability rights, it's in regards to disabled vets and the elderly. And while those are both very, very important, incredibly valuable members of our community, it's so much bigger and more diverse than that. And so it's time that those people have representation too. Absolutely. And I'm so glad that you are elevating this issue. What I've tended to realize is that like each candidate, they kind of bring something unique to the table. Like we all kind of check the boxes, so to speak, when it comes to progressive policy issues, Medicare for all, free college and whatnot. But each person kind of has that unique insight that I think is so crucial and important. You know, some will focus on housing for all. Albert Lee, who's running in our neighboring district, focuses a lot on housing, which is great. And you're focusing on disability rights. Incredibly crucial. Like my dad is in a wheelchair full time. He is unable to walk. And this is an issue I can tell you that does not get enough attention. And it's so important. And even though we've made a lot of progress, you know, the American with Disabilities Act was passed, it doesn't go far enough. And there needs to be more resources and wheelchair accessibility, um, that's one of many issues that needs to be talked about because we've, again, we've made progress, but not nearly enough. So we need someone with that perspective who knows firsthand um, what needs to be done. Now, I looked over your platform and your platform is incredibly robust. And just by looking at that really quickly, I can already tell you are someone who is eager to get in and represent the people. And I want to talk a little yes. bit about Suzanne Bonamici because she is someone who I kind of always just felt ambivalent towards she never really elicited a strong reaction to me because like we both you know uh concede she's not the worst but you know she doesn't do i think a good enough job at representing the people she rarely does town halls i showed up to the town hall that she did um a year ago and you know i i thanked her for co-sponsoring medicare for all but at the back of my mind i don't believe that she would actually fight for it in the event it came up for a vote um on top of that i asked her about a piece of legislation that was 3057. It's called the Fair Representation Act. And this is something that would end gerrymandering. It would move us to a proportional representation system. And on top of that, I think most importantly, it would institute nationwide ranked choice voting. And I asked her about this yes. and gave her the number, at, you know, the bill and whatnot. And I asked if she would co-sponsor it. And she said she'd look into it. It's been, you know, more than a year. I haven't heard anything back. So I just feel like she's not responsive to her constituents and it's just kind of you know i'll put in the bare minimum effort to make sure i pass and they're sufficiently satisfied but i want someone who's going to go further than that right so let me ask you because you're going to be my representative will you co-sponsor that piece of legislation now it's hr yes. 4000 oh see and you don't have to look into it you just know yes, exactly no, i mean i i know what that legislation is i know about right choice voting i know that we need to get rid of gerrymandering i know that the people need to be picking their representatives, not the representatives picking the people. And we need to go back to the roots of what our government was founded on and the ideals, you know, we need to make sure that the people's voices is heard and gerrymandering does not do that. Yeah, absolutely. And see, this is what really, by you just answering so quickly, and candidates like you, like it shows you guys are coming to Congress with ideas that other people don't have. Like you shouldn't have to look into whether or not you support ranked choice voting or ending gerrymandering. It should just be like, of course, it's not even a question. And I think that's why it's so important that we have younger, a new generation just get out and run for Congress because you all have ideas that would benefit working class people, certainly in Oregon's first congressional district. So you have a huge platform and there's no way we can touch on everything, but can you go over a little bit about what you represent? Because I was so excited to see, you know, single payer Medicare for all student loan debt cancellation. Um, imagine like the, the thought of you being my representative would be so exciting because I know that we would be adequately represented in this district for the first time in our lifetimes. So talk a little bit about your platform. I mean, for me, I am all about putting my money, my time, my effort where my mouth is. Everything I do and everything I say, I back up with action. I mean, I, I make sure that with the Green New Deal and everything that I am running my house on 100% green energy. And that even though I live on $735 a month, I have made that a priority to pay that extra little bit so that I can do that and have that. You know, I make sure that I am 
putting my name out there and fighting for immigration rights. You know, these things are really important to me. The woman I call a mom is a, she was an undocumented immigrant. She now has her green card. Um, but these people are parts of our community. And so it's really important to me. But for me, a social justice platform and government reform are the two biggest areas. We need to make sure that everybody is taken care of, that nobody is being left behind. And that includes our incarcerated population. You know, we need to make sure that the, we end the mass incarceration that has so many people systematically oppressed across this country, that we aren't breaking up families by sticking somebody in jail that shouldn't be there. You know, we have so many issues. Um, let's see, we have, you know, we mentioned the Green New Deal, we mentioned Medicare for All, we mentioned uh, education. Education is a big one. We need to change the way our schools, I mean, I do a lot of tutoring and mentoring of our local kids here in my neighborhood, and I have a 16-year-old that can't read, and he's still getting A's and B's and passing classes because they hired an aide to read everything for him rather than teaching him how to read, and we need to really put the focus back on what we're teaching our kids and how we're teaching them. And I mean, there are so many issues that we can solve if we just, if we stop making excuses, if we stop putting the priorities of companies and everything first, we need to stop putting the pro the priority on profits. We need to take profits out of a lot of things because that's what's ruining things. I mean, if you look at the workers' compensation system, which is completely unbelievably broken, but nobody's ever talking about it. I mean, the same private insurance companies that messed up our health care insurance, they also messed up our workers' compensation system. So we have injured workers that should be getting full care treatment, you know, back to work. And if they can't get back to work, they should be able to survive but these workers are living on starvation wages. I mean, our elderly are living on starvation wages. We need to make social security, supplemental social income, and social security disability into a living wage because that alone would cut our homelessness rate by over half. Of our 554,000 homeless across this country, 40% of them are disabled and 30% of them are over 65. So just by making those three programs a living wage, we'd be able to cut those that number in over half. I mean, we need to start really implementing real change that will affect real lives. We can't make excuses and we can't brush off legislation that people bring up to us by saying, oh, I need to look into that and I need to get more informed. We should already be informed. We know the issues that people are facing. And if they don't understand those issues, then they shouldn't be in Congress. Yeah. 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 And this district, what's interesting is that, I mean, this is a heavy Democratic district. So there's no reason why, um, you know, we don't have a representative who isn't one of the loudest members of Congress pushing the envelope on all of these ideas. There's no reason why we don't have our own member of the squad in this district exactly. because we're going to have a Democrat every single time. So there's nothing, there's no fear of losing to a Republican if you run too far to the left. There's, there, that's nonsensical. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really frustrating to know that we're getting someone who's just putting in the bare minimum effort, who doesn't right. really seem to be focused on a lot of these issues. But I am curious though, because Suzanne Bonamici, she's an incumbent who has been in there for quite some time, and she is heavily bankrolled by the industry. And you are someone who you're not going to have the backing of the state Democratic Party or the establishment. And this is a grassroots campaign. So my question to you is, how do you win successfully against someone who is a political behemoth like Suzanne Bonamici, who is going to be protected by those institutional and, you know, incumbency advantages? What do you think needs to be done? Because I know that knocking on doors and raising money is crucial. But do you think that in this district in particular, that's enough to win? And what is your kind of strategy individually to basically um, make sure we take this district for progressives? I mean, you forget that knocking on doors is incredibly hard for me because 90% right. of houses have stairs leading up to them. So that's not something I can do. I mean, so that's another challenge that we don't even really realize. Yeah. So for me, it's going out where the people are. I ride public transportation. I don't have a car for a reason, so I de depend 
on public transportation. And I make sure that we turn like every max ride and every bus ride into mini town halls to get the word out, you know? I mean, the more time that I spend talking to people, the more we can get the platform out and the more that we can get name recognition and get the word out, the more people start to talk and the more people start to, to listen. I mean, the biggest obstacle I'm gonna have is name recognition. And once people learn who I am, like you said, a majority of our our district is very progressive and they want progressive representation. But it's just that name recognition. And that's where I come into so many problems is because to get that stuff, you need money. And I refuse to take the money from the big businesses. I refuse to take lobbyist money. I refuse to take super PAC money from corporations. And I'm not going to do it. I refuse to sell my soul to a company to earn this pot. I know I can do it other ways. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. I'm used to, I mean, I live on $735 a month. I know how to stretch a dime. Trust me. I mean, I'm going to do everything I can to get that name recognition out because that's the only way we're going to win. And that's why I need the help because it's so much more challenging when you're in a wheelchair trying to get around. And people are less likely to talk to you when you're out and about without a wheelchair or with a wheelchair. Yeah, that's which is just the sad reality. Yeah, that's that's really sad. Um, and, you know, when I think about a robust democracy, I think that anyone ideally should be able to run for Congress. Mm -hmm. But the fact that you have that limitation it really kind of puts it into perspective that we're not as equal as we thought we were. I mean, certainly we all have different privileges and whatnot. You know, we have subjective experiences, but it really crystallizes it. And, you know, it's frustrating because if somebody has the right ideas, then they shouldn't be limited for reasons that they're not able to control, immutable characteristics. So the fact that you have a wheelchair shouldn't be a barrier, you know, and theoretically you could overcome that challenge, but you'd have to sell out and take a lot of money, you know what I mean, to get the name out there. And that's why publicly funded elections are so important, you know, because the only thing that should really separate our candidates is their policies. You know, I mean, it shouldn't be who raises the most money. I mean, Bonamici right now has a million dollars in our campaign fund. And we, we definitely don't have that. <laughs> definitely don't. I mean, yes. the disabled community is one of the poorest communities in the country. And, you know, bankrolling a candidate is not an option. And so we need as much help as we can get. I mean, we need representatives who are willing to step up and, and represent average people. I mean, Bonamici's worth $6 million. I don't know the last time she's been able to make an ends meet on 736, which is the minimum Social Security disability payment. That's really astounding. I don't think I've ever met anyone who's worth six million dollars except for her actually when she came to the town hall yeah it's easy to see why she's become so out of touch and complacent because when you have that much money and you're comfortable and you're not really engaging with your constituents as frequently as you should be of course you're going to grow out of touch you're in that dc bubble now you know you're part of the establishment who you're you're occupying the seat but are you fighting no. And I think you made such a phenomenal point about name recognition, because the way that I feel is in all of these elections, like all of these candidates who I talk to, yourself included, without question, if enough people knew who you were, you'd win nine times out of 10. But the real struggle here is making sure that people in that district know who you are. And I know in the first district of Oregon, if people knew about you, they would absolutely vote for you because this is a very progressive district. Like I am so surprised people who stereotypically don't seem Democrats uh, or, or, or liberal or left leaning in this district, they are actually, you know, they're concerned with the rights that you you've raised. And that's really encouraging. And what it tells to me is that Look, we can do so much better. Like, I, I appreciate Suzanne Bonamici's service. She played her part for, you know, a, a number of years. 
but it's time we get someone in there who genuinely cares about all of these issues and it's clear to me that she she doesn't care about these issues um now i want to talk about your endorsement you've been endorsed by um the oregon chapter of justice democrats which i think is incredibly exciting um has there been any interest for your campaign and can you also talk a little bit about the dynamics of this primary race because i believe there's only one other primary challenger besides you in this race but it seems like you're the go-to progressive who's actually running on a bold platform so talk through the dynamics of this race and if there's any local organizations dsa chapters who have taken interest in your campaign yeah, I mean, I'm working on my Oregon Progressive Party uh, endorsement. I've been working on um, getting a couple other local endorsements. The DSA is one that I'm, I'm hoping on. I am a card-carrying member of the DSA and have been since 2016. So I'm hoping to get their endorsement, hoping to earn their endorsement, hoping to earn the AFL-CIO and the SEIU because... Um, Unions are so important. I mean, I know if I would have had the backing of a union when I was injured, that there's no way I would be in this wheelchair right now, you know? And we need to realize that and we need to recognize that. Um, so the union support is incredibly important to me, which is why I've been out and I was out on the front lines marching with the Burgerville Workers Union when they were out striking for a fair wage and fair rights. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm trying to get out to as many as many groups as I can to get my name out because I really believe that there is more that unites us than divides us. I mean, we let little things like policy, one little policy divide us when there are so many bigger issues like everybody needs health insurance. You know, the things that we cannot avoid in life are death, taxes, and disability. It doesn't care. And these are things that affect everyone of every social economic standing and every class, every race, every religion. And we need to realize that if we just come together and find the solutions that our country and our world can be so much better, we need to stop coming up with all the reasons we can't and start looking for the ways that unite us and the reasons why we can. 100% agree with that. Um, yeah, I think that these endorsements that you're seeking are so crucial in, in terms of like getting your name out there, um, because that really is the struggle that I see with all candidates. You know, they talk about a lack of news coverage because, of course, you know, it, it's difficult enough to see mainstream media cover top tier candidates like Bernie Sanders. You know, they don't want to cover the people who pose an interest to them financially. Um, and your story is so like if people knew about your story, I think it would resonate because the really the sad aspect and why I think your story in particular is so important is because your injury was totally preventable. Had we had laws in place to protect workers like you, it would have been preventable. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because I find it so just angering that you're in this situation because workers are not respected in this country and we don't have rights. I mean, I sprained my ankle. I mean, that, that sounds so unbelievably ridiculous. I sprained my ankle at work. Um, I, it should have been six weeks of recovery, six weeks of just, you know, modified duty. But because they were like, oh, no, we really need you to do this. And, oh, no, if you, if you take that time off, you'll get fat and then you'll be useless to us. Things like that, I mean the pressures that workers face. I mean, I lost my housing and had to move my husband and I in out of California up into my parents' house because we lost our housing because I was the sole provider for our family. You know, I mean, we have to realize that what workers face when they become disabled is unbelievably undignified and humiliating. Nobody wants to live off of food boxes. Nobody wants to live off of meals on meals and have other people decide what you're, what food you're going to eat when. Um, I hate having to go in for energy assistance. It is the most humiliating thing. Um, I have had to pick up skills I never thought I would. I make a majority of my own bread now because I can't afford bread. Um, so things like that, I mean, those are the struggles that every family faces at some point in time or other. 
I mean, we're all a lost job, an injury, a sickness away from debt, bankruptcy, homelessness, and those are the real issues that need to be covered. And I mean, while Bonamici says that she supports things like Medicare for all, like you said, she has $300,000 invested in our current healthcare system. I mean, when it comes down to it, is she gonna be willing to take that big personal hit to make sure that the rest of us have care when she's not already, you know, really fighting for it? And, you know, I mean, we need representatives that are willing to stand up and lead by example and can really address these issues. And that's why I support people like Bernie Sanders, you know, and that's why I'm running. Yeah. Your experience, I think, is so important. And these types of experiences of candidates like yourself who are running, it sets you apart so much from people in D.C. because people in D.C. oftentimes, you know, they come from Ivy League schools. They're very wealthy and they they've never had to struggle like the situation like the story that you share it resonates with me so much because my dad he had his own business and was basically like starting the american dream and then he got injured and then lost everything and then we were living off of food banks you know um and you know in, in portland when we were living in portland at the time thankfully there was a lot of options for like you know food banks and clothing banks which i had to go to you know for uh, clothes for myself and whatnot growing up but um it shouldn't be a situation where you know something happens to you that's completely out of your c control and you lose everything you worked so hard to build like why why are we paying taxes if we're getting nothing in return if we could lose everything you know i was working as a restaurant manager when i was injured i was saving up to do my paramedic program so i could go back to being a, i was a volunteer firefighter and an emt and that's what i really wanted to do and so while saving up for that program i got injured and lost my entire future in a lot of ways i lost my family i lost you know uh, divorce is incredibly common when you're disabled. Um, there's so many other issues that never get addressed or talked about. And I mean, these are issues that so many people face and we've completely ignored them as a society. I mean, if you look at movies and television, all the disabled roles and everything are played by able-bodied actors. We don't ever see disability. And part of the reason we don't see disability is because nothing around town is accessible. I took candidates down there this last week and put them all in wheelchairs. We took, uh, let's see, Albert Lee, Jason Call, um, and a couple other Portland candidates around halfway before they had to give up and come back. They just, they had no idea. And a lot of people just don't until they have to face it. And the fact that we don't have anybody in Congress right now that really has to face it, the fact that most people that depend on our health and care and our health insurance system are patients, and yet there's no real patience in Congress to represent that voice as we go through this national health care debate is insane to me. Mm -hmm. You know, we can do so much better. Imagine how much better our healthcare system would be if patients actually had a voice. I mean, yeah, everything you're saying, it, it's just, I totally agree. The, the worst part is that all of these horrible things are happening when they don't have to be. Like, we are the richest country on the planet, and these things don't have to happen. Um, and I, like, I'm tired of like, if you if you shared your story with Suzanne Bonamici, I'm sure that she would, you know, say, oh, thank you so much. You're so, so brave and pat you on the shoulder. But would she actually fight? And the answer is no, we need people who are actually going to fight. So, I mean, you've already convinced me. You've won my endorsement, of course. Um, so tell people what they can do to support you. And um, even if they don't live in this district, what they can do to basically spread the word about your campaign and help you, because I am all on board and we want you to win. Thank you so much for that. That means a ton to me. Um, any help we get is appreciated. If you live in district, we need help getting the word out. We need help getting to doors and door knocking because I can't that can go out and knock on doors that are willing to help step up in that way. Um, finances, like I said, I live on nothing. We 
have a very poor community. So anybody that is willing to donate, even five dollars goes a long way. If we can get ten thousand people to donate five dollars and we have fifty thousand dollars I can make magic out of them, you know, and the big thing is recurring donations. People that can give five dollars a month, that makes a huge difference for candidates like me. Um, being able to count on that monthly donation is amazingly huge. Uh, we can do a lot with that. So any way you want to get involved, there's ways for you to help. A lot of online warriors are always welcome. Anything we can do to get the name out. So there's a place for everybody and everybody's help is appreciated. Yeah, and really getting the name out is super important because I didn't learn about you until I, you know, um, I looked for you. I believe I found you on Ballotpedia because I was curious, like, is there anyone in my district who's challenging Suzanne Bonamici, who is awesome, who's like progressive? And I found you. And I think that if people knew about you, that would really like we, we talked about the name recognition. It would go a long way because people just they want to be represented. They just need to know that they have other options. So really sharing those recurring donations and really volunteering since Amanda can't knock on doors. Again, that would be incredibly important because getting the name out, getting her name out and having conversations with people, it's less scary than you think it is. And I know a lot of people who talk to me and they say, you know, phone banking and doing canvassing, it was really intimidating at first. But once they started to do it, it became second nature because what you end up finding out is that you have a lot more in common with people than you initially think. And even though politics is incredibly polarizing and divisive, it's not as bad, especially in these types of districts where we are incredibly, incredibly left leaning and blue. Um, of course, that's not to say that we don't have our own Republicans here, um, but you're going to find people who agree with you more often than not. And if they know that Amanda CB is challenging Suzanne Bonamici and you tell her about these, tell people about these policies, we win. It's as simple as that. So uh, before we go, tell us uh, the website. It's www.cb2020.com, S-I-E-B-E 2020.com. Well, Amanda, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I am incredibly excited to vote for you. I will be setting up recurring donations since you are in my district, um, just for full disclosure. But I mean, I think it's obvious that I support the people who I bring on. So <laughs> either way, thank you so much, Amanda. Thank you. I appreciate it. Well, that is all that I've got for you all today. Thank you so much for watching. If you've made it this far on the show, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of the people who make this podcast possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. You guys are truly the lifeblood of this show. Um, you help the show not just to survive, but thrive as well. And I, I truly am so grateful to you all. This is going to be a truly uh, big, possibly transformative year. And uh, I'm just glad that we all have this community here to talk through it and deal with it all together. So it's been a really rough week with the nonsense, you know, regarding Iran. But nonetheless, we keep moving on and pressing forward. So that's all that I've got. I'll see you all next week. I'm Mike Figueredo. This has been The Humanist Report. Take care, everyone.